his applications in uh, the theory of biological ionization. Uh, basically, Reams is one of the few men I ever met that really knows how to, or that can think. There was probably three great men in, our, in this century. Nikola Tesla, uh, the guy with the organ energy, Wilhelm Wright, and Terry Reams, okay? These three people are probably the greatest people of this century. And uh, the information they put out was novel. <coughs> was accurate, correct, and did help mankind. <coughs> Reams, what he did, <coughs> as he said, a sick animal, a sick man, sick soil will never teach you anything. He says if you want to learn something, you have to learn it from a healthy man, healthy soil, or a healthy animal. Okay. So what he did is he studied healthy people, healthy soil, and healthy animals, and basically he did his testing <coughs> to find out what the numbers were, what the chemistry was of a healthy person, a healthy animal, or healthy soil, and then he tried to reduplicate that system in people who are sick. <coughs> it's kind of a novel approach, <laughs> you know? Basically, in our society, if we want to know, for instance, if we want to know what the pH, thank you, Tony, if we want to know what the pH of uh, somebody is, we would take a thousand people and we'd take the average of those people, and the average is what we would call what? Healthy. That's not true. <laughs> what you would get is you get an average of sick people. It's got nothing to do with what's supposed to be right, okay? So what he did is he found the healthiest people he could, or animals, found out their body chemistry, and then he would, uh, from there, he would try to duplicate that chemistry in the people that he was working with. You want to pass one of these out, Connie, to everybody? One to each. So what we're going to be doing is, and his greatest contribution to mankind is, number one, he found out the chemistry of what a perfect individual should be. So the formula I'm going to be giving you is the body chemistry of a perfect person, okay? Because what he found out when a baby is born, a baby has perfect chemistry and then it begins to die. And he did that for not only people, but he did that for cows and pigs and horses and dogs and just about everything else. And he checked, and what he did is he found that by checking the urine <coughs> that he could derive <coughs> all the information that he needed <coughs> in order to correct the problem, okay? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be covering how we did that. Do we have any water up here? Just ordinary tap water. I want uh, tap water, if not necessarily. Well, no, give me distilled water. It'll prove a point then. Yeah, distilled water will do because, yeah, then I can show you how to calibrate a refractometer at the same time. Basically, and what he did is he checked one, two, three, four, five basic tests on the urine to determine exactly how you have to force through the path of least resistance a body back into perfect health. Okay? The first thing that he monitored in the human body was the sugar. Now, uh, in man, the sugar is regulated by the Isles of Langerhans, which are associated with the pancreas in the body. 
Uh, basically, when uh, most of the sugar that we have in our blood system comes from the diet we eat. So when we uh, eat something, we dump a lot of sugar into the system. Thank you. Well water. Okay. We dump sugar into the system, and then uh, basically through a system of the liver, which creates the basic polypeptides in the body, produces a substance that goes to the thyroid, where it mixes with potassium, then goes to the to the pancreas and the isles of Langerhans to produce the insulin in amounts necessary to regulate the sugar in the human body. Okay? So if you have a problem with sugar in the body, it could be anywhere from the liver to the thyroid to the pancreas to the isles of Langerhans. Any one of those could be out of shape. It could be malfunctioning. That potassium is where thyroid, uh, the, the glycogen that's made in the, in the liver is mixed in the thyroid with potassium to produce another substance that goes on further to the, uh, to the uh, pancreas to be further converted into insulin. Okay, and, the, and the, the instrument that he used for this was just simply a refractometer. Okay, a refractometer measures the refractive index of a liquid. To use it, you simply put a drop of the liquid on the prism glass, close it, hold it up to the light. This is distilled water? Wow, well, way off. I'm going to have to recalibrate this. Okay, and then they basically the top will be blue, the bottom will be clear, and this will tell you, in essence, what it tells you is the ability of the fluid to bend light, which is classically referred to as the refractive index, which is directly related to the amount of sugar that is in the liquid, okay? I'll pass this around. You can look at it. It should read zero on the spilled water, the refractometer should read zero, okay? This one reads what? That's right, which means I'm going to have to recalibrate my refractometer. <laughs> but or, what? The water or the water could be not. I'm, I'm assuming that this is pure water. But you know what assumptions are, <laughs> you know? abbreviate to. And basically, in an ideally functioning human, the sugar should read 1.5 bricks, okay, or about 1.5 percent sugar in the urine. Okay, when you're, when you basically, when you dump approximately 1.5 percent sugar in your urine, it means your pancreas is working. It's, what it's doing is it's neutralizing the sugar, the excess sugar in your blood, and that your blood is carrying a maximum amount of oxygen. If it reads lower than 1.5, you're hypoglycemic. If it reads higher than that, you've got a problem. And when it gets above 9, you've got a severe, you're into what's called a diabetic state, a true diabetic state. So if you look on that refract, if you look through that thing and somebody is reading above nine, nine or above, you know you're dealing with a true diabetic. Okay? One point five is ideal. Above nine you're dealing with a diabetic. In between is too high. And, you know, this will become important when you start formulating a person's diet.
Okay, what the medical field does is they, they basically do the glucose tolerance test or whatever they call it, which measures just one sugar. You understand there's many types of sugar in this metabolic functioning. And the uh, refractometer measures all sugars. It doesn't use just the glucose, which is a unique type of sugar. See, when they use a glucose test, they only test for one sugar, and they ignore all other sugars. Not good. Which means that <laughs> the glucose can show basically come up high, and all the other sugars can be in line, but it makes them legally collect correct, which means they can put you on medication, and they can immediately call their broker and buy a new condo down in the Bahamas because you're hooked. Okay, if anybody has a diabetic problem, there's a book out I highly recommend. It's called Your Thyroid by Dr. Broda Barnes. You better read it. Because 80% of the people on insulin, according to this medical doctor, have been misdiagnosed. And these are the people that have their legs amputated. These are the people that have, go blind because it is not a diabetic problem, it's a thyroid problem. Remember I told you there's a, there's a cycle involved in this. But by putting them on I, uh, insulin, the body is going to be unable to get rid of the insulin, it's going to force it back into the muscle tissue, and that's what causes the amputations and the blindness and everything else. Let me read that comment. Look at it. reading about two okay I'm going to assume that that is pure water okay now to calibrate a refractometer there's a screw on there okay and while you look through it you turn the screw to get the line back down to zero. Distilled water. Okay, assuming this is distilled water, I've got the line right on zero. Now this refractometer is calibrated. Okay? How simple it is. Uh, there are two types of refractometers. There are uh, ones that are uh, temperature compensated and then those that are not temperature compensated. That one I have right there, and if you buy a refractometer, you want one that has an eyepiece that can adjust, like the one I got there. I believe that's an N1 by Adigo. It's one of my favorites. It has an adjustable eyepiece, because each one of us has a little different focal points there, you know, in our eye. So basically, you hold the refractometer up, you turn the eyepiece until you get a nice, clear image. And then it's fixed for you. You don't have to worry about it. Keep it calibrated. Like, as you saw, that one was calibrated a couple of months ago, but because I carry it around all over the country, <laughs> it's get out of calibration. And then what you want to do is you want to recalibrate it. That's the one I like, because I you see this goes up to 30 bricks, and if you're dealing in agriculture, it goes up high enough to where we can we can analyze not only the urine, okay, but we can also analyze uh, fruits and vegetables and things like that. So it has multiple use. That's my favorite one right there, and I like it because it has an adjustable eyepiece. There are cheap cheap ones on the market that don't have the adjustable eyepiece. It's automatic temperature control. If I was going to get one, that's the one I like. Yeah, the N1. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've passed around a catalog, and in the catalog, they have a bunch of refractometers, and it, it is mentioned in there. If you call them and talk to them, you'll know what you're talking about. The N1E is the one I like. It's 155 now. <laughs> don't buy the cheaper ones, okay, that don't have the adjustable eyepiece because you ain't going to like it. And I like it, too, because as we talk later on, I'll show you how I use it to determine the value of fruits and vegetables and things of that nature. And, you know, right now in agriculture, there's, as you'll find out, most of the food we have out there is not very good. Okay? And what we tried to do in the, in the dream theory of biological ionization is we tried to force this back to 1.5, okay? Because the higher it's reading, the less oxygen your blood can carry, the less nutrient it can carry, which is going to leave you tired all the time. It's going to leave you, it's going to keep your body from the, having the ability to nourish itself again, okay? That's the first number in the equation. The next thing we start talking about is pH. Okay, he has two pHs, okay? The pH of the uh, saliva, which should be 6.4. The pH of the urine, which should be 6.4. Under ideal conditions. Now, there's a lot of mistakes are made out here in this theory because a lot of people think just because you get the pH up to 6.4 that you got the problem solved. <laughs> Not true. Okay, if you take pH, 6.4 in this system is what we call balance. Okay? Okay, if you go up, you're in the alkaline realm, if you go down, you're in the acid realm, okay? Now, if you take a perfectly healthy baby, it will have a pH of 6.4. And as, as it begins to degenerate, okay, or as it begins to lose mineral in the body, the pH will first begin to rise. And it'll rise and rise and rise, and then as it further begins to degenerate, or as, as, as there is a further loss in calcium, the pH will begin to drop to a point to where, again, you'll come to what? 6.4. And then the pH will begin to drop further and further until the uh, person eventually reaches what we call RT, room temperature. <laughs> So a lot of times when you do the RBTI, you know, you say, oh, you can't be your pH is 6.4. You, you, that's okay. You see, these numbers are okay as long as all the other numbers are okay, too. So normally what we do is when we're basically forcing these numbers back to perfect is we take, like, somebody that's 5.5, bring them back up to 6.4, Drive the pH up as high as we can, okay? I'm talking urine pH right now, okay? I'm sorry, urine pH. I'm not on saliva right now. And then after we get it up as high as we can, and they'll normally go into one hell of a healing crisis, <laughs> sicker than dogs, then we start going into the special calcium to bring them back down into 6.4. See, what a lot of people were doing is they were jacking that pH around between 6.4 and 5.5, so they were just going back and forth across the 6.4 line, and they started this 30 years ago, and they're still there today. So, you know, they've still got a third of the way home. 
two-thirds of the way to go home yet. You're perfect. Room temperature. Dead. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> I'm going to talk about that later. I'm just talking about the numbers right now. I'm, talk I'm not talking about how to, to manipulate them yet, okay? Let's just learn the numbers first. But I'm telling you what these numbers are and what, what they represent and how we try to get back to normal. We understand when we're dealing with the urine pH, most people are acid because they're this far away from being perfect. Okay? And then we force it back up to as high as we can get it. See, most people start the breakover point too early. And they just keep bouncing them back right here. And I mean, they're two-thirds of the way away from where they could be. And then after we get the pH up nice and high, then you go back down to 6.4. If you're going to be dealing people, you see, I used to do a lot of this, but I got out of it. Because when people would come to me, I'd tell you, you're going to get sick. You're going to go through one hell of a healing crisis. Hey, yeah, sure, right. But put them on there maybe in a week or two. I mean, they call me, the, you know, on a near-death experience. <laughs> and... Uh, they never come back, okay? Because most people like being down here. You know, you're comfortable where you're half unconscious. There seems to be a comfort zone that some people like. But some people want to know, you know, what's out here. And those are the people that you really want to work with. You're going to go through, if you, if you do what I say, I guarantee you, you will go through a healing crisis. Do what? See, originally, most people would just go back and forth right here. Okay, yeah, a baby here, it gets sick here, you know, what happens is you give them uh, penicillin, which makes them go over the hump real fast, and then they get sick again, and you give them tetracycline, they go down the hump real fast, okay, and then you give them whatever. What they do is they force them downhill real quick. Same way with animals, right? Probably even plants too. But this is basically the urine pH. Okay, now saliva pH should be 6.4, and the further it goes from 6.4 in either direction, the weaker the digestive fluids are, the greater the in, the greater the inability to ionize foods in the stomach. Basically, what we're dealing with, see, this mineral, okay, good question. Okay, you understand what I got here now? You got that down. People don't understand pH at all, okay, or why it changes. Okay, in pH, I have, you have acid, you have alkaline, right? What's, what's, what is chemically neutral? Seven. 7.0. What is the pH of distilled water? 7. Okay, if I take a pound of, uh, let's say I take a pound of a sulfur compound, okay, and 10 pounds of lime, what's my pH? 7. Let's say I take 10 pounds of this sulfur compound and 100 pounds of lime. What's my pH? 7. Let's say I take 100 pounds of this sulfur compound and 1,000 pounds of lime. What's my pH? 7. Okay. 
you understand pH is a relative measure of balance. Now you can now if a person was under this circumstances of a hundred and a thousand, what is their mineral reserve? Real high, ain't it? What is it at ten and a hundred? Getting low. What is it at one and ten? There's no mineral reserve, okay? Now, it's very interesting. The higher the mineral reserve in the body, the greater what's called the buffer. The greater it's buffered. So to get a pH, if somebody's got 100 pounds of sulfur and 1,000 pounds of lime in them, it would be very hard to move that pH. I mean, it's stable. And as we begin to lose this balance, you see, this is not an even teeter-totter. <laughs> this teeter-totter is not balanced, okay? You understand? The teeter-totter looks like this. You put a pound out here, it takes 10 pounds over here to balance the teeter-totter. It takes 10 pounds of an alkali substance to balance one pound of an acid substance. Okay? Because it's a logarithmic scale, it's not a linear scale. That help you? One pound of an acid, that's right. This is why a person whose pH moves a lot, okay, or you can move the pH a lot. Well, that brings up another thing, okay. So basically, a person who is sitting up here at 6.4 has got a lot of alkalins and acids in the body to buffer the system, okay? And as you begin to deplete, you get less and less what's called reserve mineral, okay? Now, when you first start, if let's say somebody's sitting down here at 5.5 pH, and if you can't move them, chances are you can't help them. Let's say somebody's got a very sitting down here at 5.5 pH and you can't get it to move, chances are you can't help them anymore because they reach a point of no return where the body doesn't have enough ionization power to rebuild its reserves, okay? So what happens when we get somebody down here at 5.5, we start giving them the proper calciums, their pH is going to move probably sometimes between 6.5 in one day and 5.5 because you're sitting here with no mineral reserve, okay? Which means that the, the, the seesaw, okay, we're dealing with uh, something like this, all right? <laughs> but as we get more and more mineral built up in the body, the teeter-totter gets bigger, and as the, and the pH begins to rise and come back over here, you get somebody at a 6.4 that goes over the hump, their pH won't change at all once you, once you get closer and closer to that ideal number. But you have to build up the, the mineral reserve in the body to get to that point. Is this what they taught you in the school? Normally the tests are done about 2 o'clock in the afternoon when the sugar is the lowest. No. Normally, traditionally, it's done <clears throat> at 2 o'clock when the sugar is the lowest, when the energy is at the lowest point, or when the metabolic functions are at the highest and everything else is at the lowest point. We'll cover, we'll cover that yet. Okay. 
See, what happens is your body will go to any length to maintain a pH of 7.3 in the blood. Okay, and as it becomes more and more critical to maintain that pH, your acid gets, your, see, this is when you start reflecting it in the uh, urine because the body is desperately trying to maintain that 7.3 or 4 wherever your body, you see, blood type is related to pH, okay, and where if you're an O or an A or an ADB because of where your blood pH is stuck at, okay. So what your body does is it goes at great lengths to maintain that homeostasis. This is why blood tests are no good. You go to a doctor and they put a blood test on you and <clears throat> your pH is 5.5, okay? Let's say somebody comes to me, their pH is 5.5 and I says, man, your reserve energy on calcium is zero. They go to a doctor and they get a blood test. Blood, the doctor says, well, your blood has all the calcium in it you need. So who, you know, so I'm a liar, right? No. What happens is the blood is robbing the bones to maintain the calcium level in the blood to maintain the pH, all right? <clears throat> so blood tests are not accurate as far as I'm talking about reserve energies in the body. <clears throat> so a blood test may show normal calcium, and the reason it's normal is because it's robbing the bones to maintain the metabolic functions of calcium in the body. So basically you're depleting your uh, 100, 1000 system, okay? And the further you go in this scale or the more depleted you get of the, the alkaline substances versus the acid substances, the more critical the system gets, okay? Or the more radical the system gets. That help? Most people don't think in these terms. See, when a baby is born, this is where that baby is at, okay? With the high reserves, and it immediately starts. And it'll rob the mother. That's why most mothers, after they have babies, you know, their teeth go, their uh, bones go. It's because that baby, that fetus, will pull maximum amount of reserve energy so that it can start life fresh or it can with full reserve. And then it immediately begins to deplete. Okay? If you understand this, when you start working on people, it helps. If you don't understand this, some of this stuff don't make sense. So here, at 5.5, you're sitting down here, 1 to 10 ratio, okay? And as this, as your pH begins to build, what you're doing is you're going further and further into the reserves into the body, okay? Which means you become more and more stable. Your pH becomes more and more stable and harder and harder to move because it's buffered. Here you have 100 pounds of, of uh, acid substance buffered against a thousand pounds of alkaline substance. It's almost impossible to budge that system. These people can walk through hell without getting burnt, <laughs> so to speak. Okay, you, and that's what's important. You always maintain this ratio here all the way through, okay? And when you've got the, the ratio complete at its highest potential that we can, based on our frequency, you're sitting up here at 6.4. That's where you would balance out on the pH scale. Until then, it's, you follow this scale until you reach maximum reserve energy, as they call it. <coughs> According to Reams, who says there's only one alkaline food in nature, and that's the lemon. Lemon. I'll tell you how to use that. The lemon is probably the most important food you'll ever eat in the rebuilding process. Take 
they aren't alkaline. Like I said, this is different. When you start doing it from a chemical point of view, that's the way it is. Because when you eat a vegetable of any kind, when you start getting into the acid ratios versus the alkaline ratios, the acids are always higher. The only food that's ever been tested on a uh, oscilloscope that is alkaline is lemon juice. This is why we have the problem. Bear with me. If you have questions, ask, but bear with me. Okay? I'll try to, I'll try to, because I've operated in both worlds, okay? No. No, crashed lemons, yes. Because they be immediately begin, I'll talk a little bit about that when I get into lemons. It should be thin-skinned, and then there's a, they should have, uh, you can test them on a refractometer, okay? Like a lemon. I probably should have these run off too, okay? For you. A lemon should have a brick breeding of 12. Anything less than that would be substandard, regardless of how it's grown. Okay. okay, what I'm doing, okay, is I'm breaking everything down to the elemental. Uh, subjects, okay, at an elemental level. I'm talking about minerals on an elemental level. So you're going to have to weigh this into whatever system you've been trained in. And if it doesn't agree, we'll talk about it and clarify it. On a strictly chemical, from a strictly chemical analysis, there's only one pure elk, uh, alkaline food, which is lemon. Okay. <clears throat> the pH of the uh, saliva should be 6.4. If it's higher than 6.4, you've got a weak gastric juice. If it's lower than 6.4, you've got a weak gastric juice. Okay. with me so far. It's not that difficult, is it? <laughs> <laughs> on the saliva. Saliva pH, just in the saliva. No, no, I'm talking saliva. Anytime the further the saliva is from 6.4, the weaker the digestive fluid. Doesn't matter, either way. Higher or lower? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you notice I haven't told you on how to move anything yet. <laughs> The next thing he checked was the conductivity of the urine, okay? Should be what he called 6 to 7 C. Okay, now 1 C equals 700 micromoles of conductivity. Okay, if I have a glass of water here, and I stick two probes in there, and I apply a voltage across them, okay, if I have distilled water in here, what happens? Nothing. So that would be zero conductivity, all right? Now, if I put a pinch of salt in the water, let's say I put a pinch of salt in the water, and I have the same voltage applied across these two probes, 
Okay, I start at zero, right? No salt, which means no electricity flows across there, right? So I put a pinch of salt in there, okay? And because there's a little salt in there, now I'm going to start getting some electronic flow, ain't I? So now I have 100 micromoles, okay, of conductivity. I have a little flow. So now I put another pinch of salt in there. I put more salt in there. Now I have 200 micromoles of conductivity. You understand what I'm doing? So micromoles or conductivity is a measure of the amount of current that can flow through a liquid, which is directly related to the amount of salt that is in the liquid, right? This is what he's measuring. He measures the conductivity of the urine. Okay, so if we have a conductivity meter, six times 700 equals what? What's that, 4,200? Seven times seven hundred would be what? Forty nine hundred. So ideally the urine should be somewhere between four thousand two hundred micromoles and forty nine. But for the equation one C equals seven hundred micromoles, and that's how it fits into his equation. Now a conductivity meter <coughs> is a meter that has a special probe that drops down into the urine and it has a special bridge where there's two electrodes. You put that in there and that measures the conductivity of the fluid. Okay. Now they have little meters like this that you simply put down into the fluid, push a button, and you can read it right off the meter. Okay, so there's a lot of different meters for conductivity. But this is a this is a new conductivity meter. This is <coughs> this is the kind I prefer. But <coughs> these are probably three or four hundred dollars for a, a good meter. And these one run about 50, 60 bucks, okay? Okay, where's one of his catalogs? He has a whole chapter here just on conductivity meters. Okay, conductivity meters are down here on the first page, okay? Right down here. And then you can go on the second page, and he has a lot of these other ones here, like uh, DS3, DS4. These are all different ranges of conductivity meters, okay? By the way, they also have pH meters, too. Normally on the pH, we test it two ways, three ways, actually. We can test it with pH paper. Yeah, that's what I use. This pH paper is specially made to go between 5.5 five and 8.0. Right. I'll talk about that in a little while. Or you can get a pH meter. If you get a pH meter, you have to buy what's called a calibrating solution. If you're going to be operating in a 7 pH, you buy a calibrated solution at the 7 pH, where you stick the meter in there, you calibrate it at 7, and then you check your urine. It's pretty darn accurate. Okay. Now, the old method of checking pH is we had a series of dyes that we used to determine, okay? Like this would be phenol red, would give you one range of pH, it would give you a range of pH. 
okay, between 6, 8, and 8, 4. You have another, uh, this is a broma, bromophil green, which gives you a pH range of 3, 8 to 5, 4. But these are what they call wet chemical testing, okay. They have basically four of these, okay. This one is chlorophyll red, which gives you a pH of 5.2 to 5.6. So what we do is we put a drop of urine in there, actually four drops of uh, urine in four different drops, and then we put these in there and try to guesstimate the pH as good as you can based on the different ranges of pH due to the chemicals involved. Actually, most of the work I do is I pH paper, still the best. Not the best, but it, it gets the job done. If I was working in a clinic, <clears throat> I would probably get a good pH meter. This is not a real good pH meter, but it gets the job done. They have real expensive pH meters, okay. But this will get the job done. It's kind of hard. When you want to get the pH of the saliva, I still think the pH paper is the best. The next best would be the chemical. But in urine, probably the easiest and quick way to do it would be with a calibrated pH meter. Basically, what you do is you take the tip off, put it in there, and turn the meter on. But I would probably say you trust the pH paper is what I use the most, okay? Okay, the conductivity of the blood should be at about 6 to 7 C, about 4,200, let's say 4,500 uh, micromoles of conductivity of the urine. Okay, when the conductivity of the urine is running at uh, 4,500 micromoles, the body's electrical system is functioning at its highest capacity. The kidneys are functioning at their highest capacity. Now what happens is that most people run a lot higher than 4,500 micromoles, okay? And what happens is that, and the reason this is is because they don't drink enough water to clean out the salts in the body. Now, when these salts get real high in the body, what happens is that the blood starts getting thick. Now, when the blood starts getting thick, <clears throat> what happens to the blood? When the blood starts getting thick, the heart has to beat harder. That's where you get the pump in the heart, pump in the chest. And be, now, basically, in hydraulics, if you want to lower the pump pressure, you can either thin the fluid or increase the size of the pipe. Well, the body can't do either. So what it does, it has the liver secrete a special lubricating agent called cholesterol. Hmm? Cholesterol. Now, the cholesterol has a special function in the body. It adds, it decreases the friction between the blood vessels and the blood, which makes the heart pump easier. Okay. And this is a, basically, it's supposed to be a temporary fix for the body. It's supposed to be. But if we don't correct the problem pretty soon, the lubricating material begins to solidify on the walls of the artery. That's called hardening of the artery. But what is the cause between of this? The cause is thick blood, which is caused by too much salt in the blood, which is caused by not drinking enough water. Okay, you see the cause and effect situation. Man, and all these people are on these, you know, a lot of, and it also causes high blood pressure. 
because what happens now when the heart pumps against the blood vessels, they no longer dilate because they're now solid, so the pump pressure goes up. <clears throat> so what the doctors do to remedy the problem is they give you something to make the heart not pump as hard. <laughs> No, this is actually the stuff they give you are drugs which actually affect the heart firing mechanism, which means it can't fire as hard, which means it can't pump as hard, which means your blood pressure comes down and God, wonderful man. Okay, but I'm, I'm trying to teach you the processes, okay, so you understand what's going on in the body. From a mechanical point of view, I'm not a doctor, I am a mechanic. <laughs> I'm a body mechanic. <laughs> and sometimes I'm a hydraulic engineer, okay? Right now I'm a, a body hydraulic engineer. How's that? <laughs> okay, so but Reams, what he tries to do then, basically, is to get the body to spill all the excess salts in the body bring the conductivity of the blood and the body down to 6, 7, C. Okay, now the heart can function at maximum, or at the least amount of energy for the maximum amount of flow. The electrical body can function at its proper electrical potential. Everything functions good, all right? So in the Reams technology, what we try to do is to either bring the conductivity up so that the electrical pulses fire at the, in the wires at the proper conductivity, or we bring the conductivity down so that the uh, firing of the wires, you know, basically what we're doing is we're electrocuting ourselves on the present days. Most people are running at 15 to 20 C, okay? And what's happening is we're literally running 220 volts through a 110 system, okay? What we're doing is we're literally burning out our system. Well, the kidneys can't keep up because there's not enough water, so the salt block backs up into the system, okay? Are you beginning to see the mechanics of what I'm talking about? <laughs> so what happens is the kidneys are over, we're pushed to their limits. They can't do the job. And what ha which causes the electrical body to literally burn itself up to what's called over-ionized. And if it's over-ionizing, basically what's happening is that the molecules are traveling so fast that they can't adhere to and build a cell. So you're literally burning the system out. No, between this, between here, you're okay. Yeah. So if, you're lower than that, if you're lower than that, you can't get enough electrical impulse to the body, okay? Which means two things are a problem. Number one, you either don't have enough salt in your body or your kidneys ain't functioning to get rid of the salt. Uh, I'll talk about how you determine that, too, in a little while. But basically, if the salt is too low, number one, they ain't getting enough salt, or the kidneys ain't removing it from the blood. But there are indicators that'll tell you that. So too high is a problem, too low is a problem. Too high is definitely the problem, the norm. Like I said, most people are running up here, a lot of people are running up there in the 20s and 30s and 40s, which is severe heart attack range. Reams could tell when a person was going to have a heart attack almost to the month by monitoring the uh, where the uh, C number was, the salt number. All the salt. Okay, what is a salt? Okay, if I have a glass of water here, <coughs> And if I put the salt in the water, it disappears, and the electricity 
flows between the electrodes. That's a salt. So anything that will increase the conductivity of this fluid is a salt, technically. Calcium is a salt. Yes. Calcium is a metal. And the, the chemical definition of a metal is when you combine a metal and a nonmetal to form a compound. You know, Reams told me this years ago that calcium was a metal, and everybody laughed at him. But I was in a, in a lab supply store down in uh, Milwaukee. And I was, you know, I go, that's, I mean, that's hog heaven. <laughs> and I was going down the shelves, and there was a bottle of calcium, metallic calcium. Man, I grabbed that son of a gun, and now I've got some metallic calcium. And it's a metal. It's a shiny silver metal. <clears throat> so technically, it is a salt. Okay, basically, okay. 20C would be 20 <coughs> times 700 micromoles, which equals what? 140,000 micromoles of conductivity. <coughs> so you can see the problem. No, you're burning out your body. And your kidneys are basically overworked. Because the kidneys can only dump as much as they can dump. Neurological problems, angina, pectorius, all these. And I think a lot of the neurological problems are directly related to that. Yes. Anything electrically connected in the body would be related to this. Okay, but all we're doing is we're measuring the salt content of the urine and then relating it back to the system. <clears throat> okay, are there any questions about what we got so far? The next thing that he looked at would be the uh, basic change rate, okay? <clears throat> Which should be 0.04 m. That's 0.04 million particles per liter. Which is about, what, 40,000 parts per liter? Okay, basically, if you hold up the urine in a clear glass, on a perfectly healthy person, it is absolutely clear with no particles in it that you can see. And to further emphasize that, you hold it up, you take a flashlight and shine it through the urine. If you see any plaques coming out of there, anything, if you can see anything in the urine at all, you're classified it would be would be four M or four million parts per liter. Okay. Very the only time I have ever seen a point oh four M was a man that had a hundred percent kidney failure. Okay. Basically Every cell that breaks down in your body has to go out through the kidneys, through the urine. And you can actually see these dead cells in the urine. That's what we're looking at. Now, in a perfectly healthy person, this basic change rate, as they call it, is pretty low. It's at a 0.04 million particles per liter of fluid. And 
when that's happening, if you shine a flashlight up through the urine, you can see absolutely nothing. Yeah, that's how you test it. What we normally do, if we can see anything in there, it's automatically 4M with a light. And if we see a lot of stuff, it's 4M plus. But it has to do with, you see, what happens is that as long as the kidneys are working, there's going to be stuff in the urine, okay? So what tells me, if we're running at like 20C, 4M, what does that tell you? That tells you the kidneys are working, right? Now, if you're running at 20C, 0.04M, you've got a real problem because the kidneys ain't working. No, on a, what I said, when every, now, if you had somebody with 1.5, 6.4, 6.7C, 0.04M, you got a healthy person, all right? But if any one of these numbers are out of line, everything's out of line as you'll see as we go. If all the other numbers are healthy. See, not the norm, the, the perfectly healthy person. Right. I'll talk of, huh? 4M plus. If all the other numbers, I'll talk about that in a second. If these numbers are out, you want this to be high, okay, because this, I'll explain that in a second. Your elimination. Your elimination. You aren't eliminating, you're, you're, you're building up toxins. I'll explain that in a second. I got one more number to cover yet. I just want you to tell you what these numbers are and how they relate to the body. Okay, the next numbers that we use are the ureas. Okay, these are the, the proteins that we get in the, okay, basically they should be 3 over 3. Now, there's two types of ureas, okay, there's nitrate ureas, which are the top number. This, this would be nitrate nitrogen, and the bottom one is ammoniacal or cationic nitrogen, okay. This is the amount of protein that is leaving the body. Ammoniacal. Or the top one would be anionic, which is negative. The bottom one would be ammoniacal, which is positively charged. Okay, so the top one would be negatively charged proteins. The bottom one is positively charged. Uh, protein. Ammoniacal? <laughs> that I don't know. I can get it for you here in a second. But basically, you might even have that. Uh, we call it ammonia. A M M O N I U M. Ammonium. Yeah, ammonium nitrogen. The other top one is uh, ammonium nitrate nitrogen, which is NH4. The top one is nitrate nitrogen, which is NO3. NH4 is the bottom one, NO3 is the top one. This is the amount of ammonia that the body is dumping, okay? Normally, if you had a perfectly healthy person, this is what you would see. A perfectly functioning human being. Now, if you look at this equation, take a look at it a little deeper as a whole equation now. The first number is okay are the energy in. So all these are related to the amount of energy that you're, that's going into your body. 
The last two are energy going out of the body. Okay, so your first number is your sugar, your pH, your conductivity. This is all energy going into the body. The last two of the uh, base exchange and the uh, test for the ureas, that is the energy going out of the body. Now, according to the Reams theory of ionization, when there's more energy going out of the body than coming in, you're dying. And when there's more energy going into the body than out of the body, you're growing. <laughs> that simple. We're going to talk about how to regulate these numbers here in a second, okay? You guys about ready for a break? <laughs> Explain something. In reams, there are basically two types of substances, anions and cations, okay? The cations are positively charged. The anions are negatively charged. And basically, this is how the atoms are put together in the reams world. If you have a cationic substance, okay, you have one nuclear charge, which is, either, which is negative, Okay, and then you go to the atomic chart, okay, for instance, carbon, six, it would have six protons on the outside of it, okay, or six positively charged ions on the outside. Now, if you go to a negatively charged ion, you have one positively charged proton in the middle, and you'd have the number of electrons on the outside. Okay, so his molecular world is a little different than most. Very interesting. An anion, each electron in there can have a uh, energy charge, what they called in those days Milhouse units, between zero or let's say 1, to 499 units of energy, okay? A cation, okay, or a positively charged element, has a charge between 500 and 999, okay? So basically, a cationic has got a lot more charge than the anionic, okay? And mostly in the uh, energy that he does, you take the average. So uh, an anion normally has a charge of 250 millhouse units of energy. A cationic element would each individual charge would have like 750 units of energy, okay? It's really interesting how this works. Anions rotate one way, cations rotate the other. And what happens is when they come together, what happens? There's friction until they synchronize. That's where energy comes from. That's where all energy comes from. You have it stored in the internal molecules, and when alkalins and acids come together, i.e. alkalins or basically uh, anions and cations, you have friction, and that friction is the energy that we live on. Okay, the anionic elements is three, calcium, potassium, and chlorine. These are the anionic elements, okay? All the other elements are cationic. Chlorine, these are, neg these are anionic elements. Okay, it has a negative nucleus and a positive cloud. Okay, so this is actually a positive, gives it a 
a net positive charge because that's the outer cloud. This one has a positive nucleus and a negative charge on the outside. Okay, good question. <laughs> okay. That's the direction they spin looking down on them from the top of the Earth, from the North Pole. Okay. Now, there are certain elements that can be either positive or negative. This is what throws the whole damn chemistry totally out of whack. Uh, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and helium can either be cationic or anionic, which means they can flip back and forth, which is, which is it gets real interesting. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and helium can be either cationic or anionic. Okay, back to where we were. <laughs> Proteins in our urine, okay, can be either ammoniacal or they can either be cationic, okay, which are these on the bottom, or they can be anionic, which are those on the top. And then they can be either soluble or insoluble. Normally, when a protein hits the bloodstream, it is soluble. If the protein is in the body for more than three days before it is ejected, it becomes insoluble. And these are the, this is what gives our body most of the problems, is the insoluble proteins in the bloodstream. Okay, to check the proteins, what we do is we have a spot well plate. And in there, in a test tube, we take six drops of what they call a universal extracting fluid, which is nothing more than Morgan extract from a Lamont chemical soil test. And we put one drop of urine in there, and we mix it real good. And then in the spot well, we put one drop of this mixed urine with the universal extract, and then we have two different test kits. We have an ammoniacal, for ammoniacal nitrogen, and we have one for uh, nitrate nitrogen, and we put four drops of that, okay? And we'll do one probably this noon. And then we, by the colors that we get, we can read the different uh, strengths parts per million of the nitrate nitrogens in the urine or the ammoniacal nitrogens in the urine, okay? Okay, normally we want to see these low, free, free, but if any of these numbers are out, we would like to see this total combination when they added together to read at least 10 or more, or 12 or more. <coughs> Because what happens <clears throat> if these numbers are real low on this side and these numbers are out of whack? Our kidneys ain't working. It ain't leaving the body. <clears throat> okay, you have a handout in front of you that looks like body chemistry. Okay, basically in the Reams testing, he classified the numbers according to zones, okay? For instance, zone A would be perfectly healthy person across the top here, okay? Zone B would be the set of numbers where people are not quite perfect. Okay, zone A, you would have about 95 to 100% of your reserve energy. Zone B are a set of numbers where 
your uh, reserve energy is between 75 and 95, okay? This is a set of numbers that they're not quite perfect, but they're not really bad, okay? And then we go up to zone C. When the numbers are in zone C, your basic reserves are even lower yet, okay? But then we get back down to below 50% reserve energies is when we start getting into zone D down here. And the last zone before room temperature would be zone E. Okay, so when we talk about a number being in a zone, that's what we're talking about. Okay? 90, that's perfect. That's 95%, 95 to 100% of your reserve energy. Zone D would be 25 to 50% reserve energy. <coughs> Zone E is 25 or less. When people's numbers start falling down here in a 25% zone, you got a real problem. That's when you got problems, okay? So basically, when we're working on somebody, trying to get them healthy, we want to get the, remember, these numbers from here over is energy in, the energies, albium here over is energy out, okay? So when we're working on people, we like to keep the albium high and we like to keep the ureas high because we need to dump the toxins in the body. Then what we want to do with the other numbers is we want to bring them as close to perfect as we can here, okay? These, if they're low, we want to drive them up. If they're high, we want to drive them down. And when you work on somebody, first of all, we'll notice that four, you're probably dealing with 4M all the time. And if you drop down and you can't see somebody, anything in their urine, you're probably dealing with kidney failure. And I don't know what to do there. You can either see it or you can't. Well, you either you can get dialysis, or we can go into other disciplines that we talked about yesterday as far as kicking things in gear, right? Magnets, color, electricity, all kinds of things that we use with men. As far as reams, we don't have anything. If so, if you go to 4M, you can't really do anything because at that time they had no technology to deal with the problem. So when, when you're working at somebody, you want to see debris in the urine. Here's what's going to happen. Let's say somebody comes to you and they're up here at 26. Your urea is a total 26 when they're added together, really high. They're in a heart attack zone. They've got a very dirty colon. Every, nothing's, you know, I mean, it's working. When you first start them on a pro program, it's going to drop down, okay, because they'll get rid of all the insoluble proteins, and then they'll j jump back up, and you want to keep them between 15 and 20, okay? Because you need to keep that energy going out of the body. You need to keep the debris moving out. And all the time what we're doing is we're working to keep these two, three sets of numbers. We try to force them as close as perfect as we can. Now, but remember, this side of the equation, we want to read high as long as we can because we've got to get rid of the stuff out of the body. You want to keep the ureas high, you want to keep the albium high. Right, while we're in the healing crisis. What we want to do, we want to keep the energy section out high but you understand, the further we are from perfect, the less energy we're coming in. So in essence, what we're doing is we're keeping the energy in, we're forcing it higher, but we also want to keep the energy out high also. Because what happens when you've got a lot of energy going into the system and none going out? <laughs> it's going to blow up like a sausage, okay? Keep that in mind when you see the numbers. So basically, the further the numbers are from perfect, the less energy you've got going in the body. It goes this way up to the top, 
and then from the top down, okay? So if somebody's sugar is in the B range, it's not that much of a problem, okay? If they're down, their sugars are down here in the D range, you've got a real problem, okay? Uh, pH, okay, again, I'd, I'd much rather see somebody up into the B and C range than I would down into the D and E range. The same with the salts. A lot of times, as long as your salts are high, at least the body's trying. But when you start getting salts below 6, you're dealing with some real severe diseases. And the same is true when the albium drops below there and the urea has dropped below there when these other numbers ain't perfect. You've got a problem. That's what those numbers are telling you. Oh, urine, yeah. Right. Really don't deal too much with the saliva. But no, that also applies to saliva, too. If your urine saliva is at 6, 8, it's a lot better than it, or I mean, if your saliva pH is 6, 8, it's a lot better than 6, 0, right? Because here you're in zone B, here you're in zone D. Okay? Okay? Both. 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 This is both. And the closer they are together, the better off you are. What happens when one high and one low, you're getting a lot of gas, you're getting a lot of anions and ions just fighting each other with no con contribution to the body. No, no, no. They're each separate, each separate. The urine saliva should, uh, the saliva should read here, okay? This is, this is both separate, okay? Your urine saliva should be there and your, uh, sorry, your urine pH and your saliva pH, okay? These are both separate. So. This is the worksheet we normally use on people. And what we do is, if, like at the first screening, let's say their, their uh, sugars were 5, we'd put a line there. And if their uh, urine pH was 5.8, we'd draw a line to the 5.8. If their saliva was 7, we'd draw it to 7. So your lines would diverge, OK? And then if their salts were at 30, we'd draw another line up there like that. And the further these go apart, the worse the problem. Okay. And then we draw another line to wherever the ureas are. That'll give you a real good, healthy. Uh, that's a very good screening uh, tool that I use in the in the process because you can look at it, you can see what's going on right away. And this is basically the worksheet that we use. And what we do is, like the first screening, we use a red pen, okay, put the date in red. Second screening, you use a green pen, do it in green. Third, use a different color. That way, you, everything is on one sheet. Now, when, when you're doing a person in a reams testing, you want these numbers to start going towards perfect, and you want to keep the outgoing energy in this realm here, okay? And if you do that, your patient will feel good, and they're getting better at a regular at a regular rate. And healing crises normally occur, okay, when these numbers jump these lines here. These lines are drawn there for a reason, because these are energy lines. These are orbits, okay. When the pH drops between eight five. And eight, you go through a healing crisis zone, okay? When you go like a salt content from 35 to 34, you'll go through a healing crisis as those numbers jump from one zone to another. So if you do a screening and somebody says, God, I'm sicker than a dog, chances are one of these numbers jumped the line, okay? Mm -hmm. 
What number? Give me a number. Uh, let's say three. Okay, right here. Okay, you Okay, then you draw one to six, okay, for this for the saliva. And then and then let's say the 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 urine is point two. Then you draw another line from there to six point two. So you got two lines coming off the sugar. Okay. And then I would mark one urine, one saliva. And then you'd go back to wherever the salts were. Okay. 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 If you don't understand, let's get it done. Because <laughs> you're getting in 30 years what I got, and you're getting in one day what I got in 30 years. <laughs> and this will give you a handle of what's happening to the energy in the body. And basically, the further that these numbers get, okay, this way you're, let's say a perfectly, the further they go this way, the sicker you get. And then the further they go this way, the sicker you get. That's the way it is. So far we haven't talked about anything about moving the numbers, have we? We just talked about the numbers and what mm -hmm. they mean. Forget everything you ever learned. <laughs> okay. You're in, you're in a different game. Forget. Basically, we're talking about the urine, which is a cause and effect situation. That's all we're talking about, okay? I'm talk I'm, when, we, when we do the urine, we're basically talking about a an effect, okay, of something that ain't quite right in the body, okay? And we're going to start talking about how we basically correct these things shortly. Okay? Everybody understand that to a point. Well, I might as well just leave that. Can I leave? Should I leave that on or take it off? Okay. Now, let's say we want to start correcting the sugar on a diet. Okay. Now, anytime it's a real good check on diet. If you've got your own refractometer, anytime you eat something of a sugar nature that's bad for you, what's going to happen? Sugars are going to go up, right, or down. Anytime you eat something that is good for the sugar metabolism, the sugars will go towards perfect, okay? One of the best things that Reams ever did, or said one of the best things for correcting the sugar, well, the first thing, by drinking more water, distilled water, you will bring the sugars back into the line. That's the first step, okay? He used distilled water. Okay, normally what he did is he drank four ounces of water every half hour. Okay? You take your body weight, divide by two equals ounces of water per day. If you drink more than uh, four ounces, the body, the, what happens is the body will flush through the kidneys and it won't remove anything. If you drink less than that, you won't get maximum benefit from the abilities of your organs. Half, okay. Four ounces every half hour. And then the amount toward the whole day would be you take your body weight, divide by two. If you're 200 pounds, that would be 100 ounces of water a day. Four. <clears throat> well, the bigger you are, the more you can handle. <laughs> okay? 
If you were a 100-pound lady, you got 50 ounces, okay? 200-pound man would be 100 ounces a day. No, no. That's optimum right there. Okay, what that does is that it'll immediately, see a lot of times the sugar is high because we don't have enough water in our body. So by drinking the water, it'll help the kidneys remove the sugar, and it'll bring the sugar down to a point, okay? The next thing that he used to bring the sugars down was don't eat sugar. I mean, if your sugars are sitting up here at 10.5, okay, don't eat sugar. <laughs> Very simple. None. Zero. Although he said fructose doesn't, doesn't affect it one way or another, but I tell people don't take any sugar under any circumstances, okay? Hmm? No honey. No sugar. No sweet stuff of any kind. No fruit. Cut back on your fruit. Okay? That's the second thing you can do. And the third thing that we found that gets the pancreas going is green drinks. <clears throat> Knowing what I know now, you need to get that book, Eat Right for Your Type. Okay? In there, there's a bunch of vegetables that you can use for type O's or A's or B's. And juice them. Because I think one of the reasons we had problems in the past is because people would just randomly eat vegetable, green vegetables, and if you're allergic to them, they could be a problem. Now what I recommend, you get the book, Eat Right for Your Type, juice only the vegetables that are non-antagonistic to your blood type. I think we'll get I think we can cure diabetes just with that, okay? No. All of them. We're just starting because that's the furthest left on the sheet. <laughs> okay? The next thing Reams used to help rebuild the body was lemon juice. Okay, the secret to lemon juice is nine ounces of water, one ounce pure squeezed lemon juice. Okay? It's got to be fresh. And it should be the higher the uh, brick reading, the better the lemon. Normally, good lemons are smaller, thin shelled, and round. The six shell lemons normally ain't worth the money to. Lime does not do the same thing. Okay? Only lemon. Very unique piece of stuff. Okay. Now, when you incorporate the lemon juice into your diet, Okay, I'm going to, basically the way he did this, okay, we had the distilled water, four ounces, distilled water, on the hour, four ounces, lemon water, on the half hour, okay? You alternate one between another all day long. Okay, now, if, well, go ahead and write that down. <laughs> but that's ideally how you do it. Mm -mm. If you have a sugar problem, you don't add any sweetener to the lemon, okay? Now, wait a minute. We're going to talk about something. If your sugars are low, you better be adding a sweetener to it because you don't have no energy, All right?
Either I have, I have not checked it yet, I can't say. But let me tell you something how you can check it. If you've got a refractometer and your sugar is, say, up here at 6.5, and you add the, what do you call it, stevia? Stevia, and it drops down okay. If it goes up, no, you can't. So you, know, you, you, you have an instrument now to check to see whether it's any good or not. I would probably add it to my lamp. I keep your distilled water distilled all the time. Can you clean a window with milk? Can you clean it with orange juice? You can only clean it with pure water, okay? Yeah, in the half, on the half hour, right. Now, in the lemon juice is where you would add your sweetener to check it. But it's very important to drink the distilled water, distilled water. Okay, now, ideally distilled water should have 50 micromoles of conductivity. Now, if it goes lower than 50, it'll start drawing stuff out of the body, good stuff. If it's above 50, you really won't get maximum benefit from the water. the conductivity meter with this meter right here or with this meter right here. Okay? You check that with a conductivity meter. Normally if you got your own testing kit, you know, I've done this every day for six or seven months or my, myself. Okay. And other people basically once a week or once after every healing crisis. Okay? She asked when you should test. You got your own testing equipment. I do it. I did it every day for <laughs> a long time. Okay, if you have. Yeah, I charted it on that chart right there. You got, you got a patient, you know, they can't afford it. Oh, you have a question? Normally, if it tastes good, you got it. <laughs> okay. But you you don't use sugar if if your sugars are high on the refractometer. You don't use sweeteners in in the lemon juice. If they're below two, I would definitely use them. Okay, definitely. No, you want the sugar to. If you got 6.5 sugar, you're not going to, uh, on a refractometer, you're not going to add any sugar to your lemon water. Oh, good question. What happens if you're at 0.7, you add sugar, nothing happens? Try honey. Try fructose. Try maple sugar. Okay? Then cut back a little. Well, a bad lemon is better than no lemon at all. <laughs> okay. But if you have it, I go to the store and, you know, I can tell just by feeling them anymore what they are. And if they're good, I'll buy a bunch of them and refrigerate them. If they're bad, I'll buy one or two and wait for the next one to come through. Case history, I had a baby once that was really sick and they called me over to, you know, to check it out. And we wrung some urine out of the diaper and the damn sugar was running zero, okay? So we took the baby, and I said, this baby, you know, don't have long in this world, so, and the sugar was zero, so what we did is we took some honey, put it on your uh, thing, and put it in the baby's mouth, and he turned his head, yeah. We put some uh, molasses on there, turned his head. So I said, give the damn baby some sugar, at least we'll... You know, my, I said to myself, it'll die happy. They put some sugar on that finger, and that baby just sucked that thumb like it was no tomorrow. Okay? 
So what they did is, is damn, <laughs> we added a bunch of sugar to the baby's formula, and that within a week, that kid was up and going on white sugar, you know. So I went by the numbers, you know, and then I watched the kid. But the kid was, I mean, it was six or seven months old and just skin and bones, okay, and they, they tried everything, nothing worked. The problem is the kid had no energy. The damn sugar was sitting on zero. I mean, that kid had all the mineral, but there was no spark plug in him. So, and what we found just by, you know, the baby told us, you know, sugar is what it wants. So they put white sugar in the damn formula, and man, that kid took off like a weed. And then we checked the numbers again, and then the sugars came up, okay, up into here, and the kid, I saw him about a year later, man, the kid was bouncing around the store getting into all kinds of stuff, which was good, you know. It's better than laying there and dying, you know. But it was white sugar that turned it around, and it was a refractometer that told me where the problem was, okay, right there. Crib death. Yeah, let me see how we're doing on tape. Okay, so basically the sugars. If the sugars don't raise, check the different sugars to see which one will, okay? It could be white sugar, it could be fructose, it could be uh, honey, it could be anything. You don't know. But whatever, if, if the sugars are low, bring them up. Because this is pure energy right here on the sugar, okay? Ninety ninety percent of the problems with people today is high sugar, way too high. So most of our problems is bringing it down to a realm where the body can handle it. Normally, the sugar is above nine is diabetes. Then we go through what's called the zone of misery, <laughs> okay? And then we enter into feeling good. That's basically how that works. Hmm? Yes, and, and this is bliss right here, okay? <laughs> and uh, so the main thing is we want to regulate the sugar to get it back down to where the blood will carry oxygen and or other things, you know, minerals and stuff. But the higher the sugar gets, the less oxygen it can carry and the less mineral it can carry. The lower it gets, the less oxygen it can carry, the less mineral it can carry. And what he used for that was what I told you, just what I told you. And the best thing, and if you have any herbs that, okay, basically if the sugar is high, if you're an herbologist, use the herbs that go along with it. But green drink was the best thing in the world that we ever found to bring sugar down. And now with the information in Eat Right for Your Type, I would use those greens specifically for that blood type, juiced. They gotta be juiced. And they gotta be drank fresh, or they don't work. But Eat Right for Your Type? Wheatgrass is not wheat. Normally I eat that, uh, what do they call it, Ezekiel bread, which is wheat that has been sprouted, dried, and then reground. Just about everybody can eat it. So a sprouted wheat. Basically, the problem, I believe, is that every grain has uh, enzyme inhibitors in it. And some people just are allergic to the enzyme inhibitors in the wheat and the beans. And once you sprout it, it's not the same food. Any questions on uh, sugar?
I can have her run this sheet off. I, I'll have her just run one off for you. Okay. One of the uh, substances that Reams used was for rebuilding the body was a substance he called mincol. Mincol is nothing more than uh, soft rock phosphate. It's got over 84 different minerals in it, all of them in a colloidal form, in a true colloidal form, not the stuff we talk here about today. This is a test to show you some of the minerals that are, that are in mincol. And everybody that was on a Reams program was on mincol. I take three tablets a day. If I don't, my teeth hurt. Okay, now how you make mincol is very simple. You have a pail of water. You dump in the mincol with a soft rock phosphate, which is nothing more than fertilizer. Okay. And you stir it up. Okay. And you'll end up with a cloudy substance in suspension. You let it sit for maybe a minute. And then you dump this liquid off into another container, OK? Then you fill this up with water again, and you mix it, and you'll end up with a cloudy substance again. And then you decant that off into the bucket. And then you boil off all the water. The residue that you have left is pure, unadulterated, bodybuilding insult. Nothing better in the world. That's how you make it. It doesn't make much difference. You just want to, the more water you bring, put in here, the more you'll get in suspension because it's limited to the colloidal capabilities of the water. Okay? Hmm? Ideally, distilled deionized water would be best, yeah. But all that is a soft rock phosphate. You mix it with water, and it gets real cloudy and syrupy. You dump that off, and then you boil off the water. I like boiling it because, you know, you never know who stepped in it. <laughs> well, we normally put it in an oven at about 300 degrees until it burns off, and then you have the powdery residue in the bottom of the pan. That's mincol. That's probably the best bone building, body building material you can possibly get. It's from plant tissue, plant and animal tissue, so it's organic. It's just that it's been in a storage locker a million years. Plant and animal. I get mine from Doc Chow. Uh, Lake City, Florida is where Vermilion, Florida. Uh, you might talk to, what's his name here? Uh, Bob Pike can get it for you. Daily. The only thing I don't like about daily, you see, there's another way of making this stuff, is they take a hopper and they run a, a stream of dry mint call down, and then they have a fan and they blow it, okay? And you end up with the, uh, the fines over here and the solids over here. So daily separates his men call by air, and I don't like it as much as the liquid separation. It's just not the same. See, this is a liquid separation of the colloid. This is an air separation of the colloid, and it's not the same. You just keep adding water to this until you don't get any cloudy substance anymore. What you're doing is you're extracting the colloidal part of the soft rock phosphate. See, a colloidal is what? 0.2 microns in diameter. It'll stay suspended in water indefinitely. So what we're doing is we mix the soft rock with water to suspend the colloidal mineral out of it, which is 2 microns. And then we decant the water. As long as you get a cloudy water, you're, you're extracting the colloidal fraction of the soft rock. Just a little. You stir it, light up a cigarette, <laughs> put it down. Yeah, I used to be able to use that phraseology. I can't anymore. <laughs> light up a cigar. 
put it down, and then decant the liquid off, and then boil the liquid off, and you have pure soft rock. Or pure corn. You can't overdo it, let's put it that way. I normally take three caps a day. I'm very severe, because I've got root showing in my teeth, okay? And if I don't do it right, I'm in bed for three days with a toothache, because I'm trying to rebuild my teeth. And this is how you do it. You give kids this stuff. It's interesting, children basically, very young babies, we take this mint call and we rub it on the bottom of their foot. And it soaks right in, I mean, it just disappears right into the foot. We put a little bit in their baby formula. And the babies we do that on when they teeth, there's no infection and them teeth come right out. Their jaws are nice and wide and spread. Their bones are fully developed. They're just no problems at all. Right on their foot. Because on your foot you have very large cells and our feet will absorb minerals right through the feet. It's probably our second stomach <laughs> is on the bottom of your feet. If you ever want to get anything into your body, there's three ways that I do it. Through the mouth, rectally, and foot bath. <laughs> okay, you can't overdo it because it is a slimy substance and it will it could gum up the work. So I limit it to Reams used to go as high as like six tablets a day was his maximum that I ever found. I take three tablets a day that Three double odd caps a day that I've made myself. But the distilled water, the lemon juice, and the mincol were about 80% of the Reams program. This, this is bodybuilding stuff. This rebuilds tissue. This will rebuild hip joints. It will rebuild sockets. The only thing I would add to it would be gelatin protein <coughs> for rebuilding hips and joints and ligaments. Nerve tissue? For nerve tissue, I would probably add B6 to it. Well, it's about 11.30. You want to kind of break for lunch so we can get back here if people want to go to a restaurant early? Before I get on to the next subject. <laughs> go ahead, Brady. Okay, we have any questions after lunch here? Come up during lunch. Another herb that Reams used to help control the sugar was comfrey, to some extent. Comfrey. Okay, the next thing we're going to get into is the pH, okay? Of the urine. We'll talk primarily of the urine, okay? Now, basically, I better use black so it shows up here. Now, to get the pH, ideally we what? 6.4? Okay, as we go upscale, we get to 8. Downscale, we go to 5.5, .5, okay? Now, there's different calciums that we use for different things, okay? The most potent calcium we have to work with is calcium oxide, or uh, calcium, slack line, C-A-O-H, okay? It's only to be used when you are below 6.4, okay? Black line, calcium hydroxide. And you only use it in the liquid form. 
Calcium hydroxide in a powdered form is poisonous. Calcium hydroxide in a liquid form is not poisonous. But it can be poisonous when you start getting up above 6.4. Because basically, you can push the body right off the scale. <laughs> that is very, very potent calcium. You start using it a teaspoon at a time. And, it only, and I only use it under supervision when I can monitor the pH. Because if somebody's pH moves up here to 7 and you keep feeding them the calcium hydroxide, you could drive them into a coma. <laughs> the liquid. Calcium hydroxide is only in the liquid form. You put about one tablespoon in, or you just, you got a gallon of water, you just keep, put a couple tablespoons of calcium hydroxide, stir it, and you've got your liquid lime. You've got your lime water. They call, they call it lime water. You let it settle out and then you don't, you, the settlings are not part of the action. And you just use the liquid. Okay, say you're, you're going to use a still plus three, but you get the kidney drop back to five three. Do you think you need that again? Probably if it started fluctuating above and beyond 6.4, I'd cut way back. So how much of a tablespoon of water? You, uh, just a couple of heaping teaspoons to a gallon of water. It doesn't make any difference. You add it, and when you start getting stuff dropping out of the bottom, you're, you're saturated. So let's say a couple tablespoons, okay? Get a gallon of water, put a couple tablespoons in there, stir it, and you'll get some settlings on the bottom. When you start getting the settlings on the bottom, you know you got what's called a concentrated solution. The ionized distilled water, yeah. That is very potent stuff. You never use it unless you monitor the urine pH, all right? Never. I'm not on saliva pH. Got nothing to do with this. The next calcium we use is calcium carbonate. Now remember, we're in an acid condition below 6.4 would be just ordinary lime, CaCO3, calcium carbonate. He mixed it with a, basically with some yeast to make it work a little body, better in the body. But I've not had a whole lot of good luck with uh, He had a product called Cal2, which was a mixture of calcium carbonate and a little yeast because he found the body would accept it better when he did that. But calcium carbonate, is, again, these are for when you're acid. On the other end of the scale, if you're alkaline up here above 7, the calcium you want to use is calcium lactate. Calcium lactate is soluble when the pH is up there in the high 6s and in the 7s. You don't want to give a person that's acid calcium lactate, okay? So calcium hydroxide is only used when you're acid. Calcium lactate is only used when you're alkaline. Yeah, I haven't come to them yet. Your calcium citrates would be used down here also. Uh, it'll work at most of your uh, acid pHs, too. Ninety percent of the people are acid. Another calcium that's good at all pHs is calcium glutamate.
You have to be careful with calcium glutamate if you have a sugar problem because the glutamate is a sugar. So if people are reading high on the refractometer, you don't give them calcium glutamate. Okay? Because it, will, it is a sugar and it will raise the sugar on the refractometer. Okay, another interesting thing when it comes to vitamins. Okay, vitamin C, I'm talking about ascorbic acid now. I'm not talking about mineral ascorbic. I'm talking about good old-fashioned ascorbic acid. It can be used large amounts with people that are alkaline. In fact, it's very beneficial. Ascorbic acid. Okay, if somebody is uh, acid, you don't want to give them ascorbic acid, but they can use what's called the mineral ascorbates. Okay, like calcium scorbate, potassium scorbate, and you can use the, the mineralized vitamin C. Never give an acid person ascorbic acid, which is pure vitamin C. But what we have, we see, years ago we didn't have the mineral ascorbates that we do now. So basically we kept people off of all vitamin C until their pH got up and then we'd start introducing the vitamin C into the diet with them. Cal uh, calcium glutinate is soluble, I mean, which means it'll go into solution on any pH range. It's not pH sensitive. It'll bring it into balance either way. It will bring you into balance either way. People with weak digestion, it works very good. Children, it works very good. But again, if they have a sugar problem, you can't use it. Okay, at the opposite end of the spectrum, we have vitamin D. You, vitamin, the more acid they are, the more vitamin D they can take. You don't want to give vitamin D to somebody that's very alkaline. And normally what we do is, what I do is I keep them heavy on the, glute, on the carbonate, heavy on the oxide or the other stuff until I get the pH somewhere up to around 8. But when I start getting up around 8, you can start introducing the calcium lactate. Remember, we want to drive it back down. Remember our little graph here? So I keep them on basically on the... Uh, the the acid calcium's well up into maybe seven. Then I start introducing the uh, calcium lactate because now the lactate can become part of the uh, body function. Up until that, it can't. Orotate formulas, I'd probably start down here. Yeah. The hydroxy probably would be on the acid form because uh, they're, they've basically taken that off the market as far as I know. No? Okay. Okay, because I know it's getting harder and harder to get. Again, what's the, what's the, if there is any, any doubt, what do you do? You watch that pH. If, if, it's, if it's not moving in the direction you want it to move, you're not on the right calcium. What I also found is I put people on a little hydrochloric acid, too, when they take the calcium. 
Okay, hydrochloric acid. What I do is I get a 10% solution. 10% HCl. Okay, that's my base stock. And then in four ounces of water, I add two drops. It tastes a little lemony. And I take that right after I eat. That will ionize the calcium and it will ionize everything else in there. And it'll help drive the pH. Especially acid people, okay? It'll help drive that pH back up to normal, okay? Because acid people, uh, you know, it will help dissolve the... See, one of the problems I found with calcium carbonate that people couldn't digest it. So if you add a little hydrochloric acid with it, it really helps. And the pH comes up faster. Bone meal would probably be good over all pHs, too, if you can find a good one. But the main thing is when you're working with somebody, Pay attention to what they're taking and which way the calcium is moving. Remember the secret, you want it to move up to 8 and then back down to 6.4. But when people, when their pH starts steadying out at 8, heavy on calcium lactate, heavy on ascorbic acid. Stop these down here. Right. Milk is rich in calcium lactate. So milk is real good for people who are alkaline, okay, from a chemical point of view. Milk is not good for people that are acid. Okay, orange juice, grapefruit is acid, okay. So if people are very acid, you don't want to have them on any of the, the uh, acid drinks. But what you can do is add a little baking soda to the orange juice, to the grapefruit juice. Now it becomes totally available to the body. Baking soda. It'll fizz, pop, bubble. <laughs> so what it does is it knocks the acid out. And now you have an alkaline vitamin C that an acid person can take. Makes the stomach work good. See, you're neutralizing it by putting it in the acid. You see, orange juice for a person that's acid is going to hurt them. If you put the baking soda in there, it ain't going to hurt them. Grape, grapefruit juice is acid. An acid person can't take it. If you add a little baking soda to it, an acid person can take it. And man, you will get a high when you take it. <laughs> a good high. It's legal. <laughs> the main thing is you've got to get that calcium in the body because... Okay, does everybody see what I got here? People got to take calcium. You might as well plan on taking it the rest of your life because it ain't in the food. Okay, it just is not in the food. So I take calcium all the time. If somebody was at a perfect 6.4, I'd probably give them one lactate, one carbonate, okay? Or glutinate, yeah. To keep them there. But basically, you want to move that pH toward 6.4 over the hump. Okay, no, not necessarily. I haven't got into the food aspect of it. On a Reams program, if you're acid, you would stay away from orange juice, grapefruit juice, things of that nature. Then you would, if you'd put... What we found that if people do drink orange juice in their acid, if you add the baking soda to it, 
it's not harmful, it's actually beneficial. Or grapefruit juice. About a quarter of a teaspoon in a glass. It'll fizz, pop, boil, bake. Mm -hmm. One lactate, one calcium carbonate. Or you can just take uh, any any of the calciums that'll keep you hung on 6.4, okay? And if it starts changing, you got to start changing your calcium. Calcium carbonate is a plant form. Calcium hydroxide is a plant form, or uh, an animal form. This is all derived from p past life transgressions. <laughs> These plants are not high. The weight. I'm not going to get it. I'm sorry. I have yet to find a plant in this day and age that's high enough in calcium to take care of, to raise the pH to where I want it, okay? For instance, alfalfa should have 4% calcium in a real healthy plant. Most of them run at 0.8 or lower, right? Well, <laughs> no. Can if they have the calcium out there. The best I've ever seen is 4.0. But you know, we're in we're in La La Land. I'm sorry. I've been an uh, agricultural consultant for 25 years. I've tested thousands of tests. I've never seen it, okay, on a, as a rule. Uh, I've seen it once or twice. And those people, they had 10,000 pounds of water-soluble calcium, 400 pounds of phosphate. I mean, they had things working. Hmm? But this was actually out in California, out, or not in California, but on one of the slopes of the Rockies, where the calcium was actually running like 12, 15,000 pounds per acre. I've heard You understand, our agriculture is so damn bad it cannot sustain life, period. Okay? Like I said, I've tested soil. All over the United, all over North America, there ain't no good soil. Period. And there ain't no good food. Yeah. So you know, you know, you can help with herbs, but it will not take care of the severe deficiencies that we have. For instance, like I mentioned yesterday, 80% of your body comes from the air. 20% of your body comes from the ground, okay? This is by weight and volume. Okay, let's take this 20% and break it down. Of that 20% that has to come from substance, 80% of that is calcium, 20% of that is all other trace elements, okay? What's the most important element in your body that you get from food? <laughs> that comes out to about 16% by weight, total weight. And it ain't in the food. It just ain't there. Uh, 
Okay, if you take a biomass, okay, if you take a mobile meat box, <laughs> and you analyze it chemically, 80% of you comes from the air. 20% of you comes from what you eat. Now, now we're going to analyze that 20% of that comes from what you eat. 80% of what you eat is calcium. 20% is the trace minerals. Here's what an organic molecule looks like. The center of the molecule is basically nitrogen, okay? Where does that come from? It comes from the air. Then it, it, it has a ring around it of carbon. Where does that come from? It comes from the air. Then it has a molecule of OH. Where does that come from? It comes from the air. What's CHO? Sugar. What's CHON? Protein. Okay, then it puts on the first major hard shell. That hard shell is calcium. And that can only come from, if it's a plant from the ground, or if you're a people, it can only come from the food you eat. Then it puts on shells potassium or a phosphorus potassium or according to its frequency. It adds the elements according to its frequency. How does it do this? It does it through electroplating. People don't realize how the body really rebuilds. Your body builds electrically. How how do that potassium ion know where to go? How does it know that? <laughs> does it have intelligence? The body builds like an electroplate, okay? If I put a voltage across these two wires, let's say this is copper, copper wire. The copper will leave one electrode, go to the next electrode, right? And leave copper in the solution. That's how the body rebuilds. We are an electroplating tank. We have an electrical wire system. It's called our blood vessels, which are, which the blood vessels are the insulators. The blood, which is salt, is the wire. Okay? The controlling frequency of where a mineral goes is caused by the nerve endings that go to each cell you know, each cell in your body is connected with a nerve fiber to the brain. And that the nerve signal that comes through that particular nerve is what attracts the minerals to rebuild that cell. It's real interesting. In, in, in the industry, they have these magnets that if you make an electromagnet and you pulse it at a particular frequency, you can pick up aluminum. You pulse it at a different frequency, you can pick up copper, okay? You understand what I'm talking about? What the body does is we have a brain up here, which is a frequency generator. If it needs copper in an organ, it'll, it'll vibrate that nerve at an electromagnetic frequency that'll draw the mineral to it it needs. That's how the body functions. And that's how the copper, it don't know how to get there but it is attracted there by an electromagnetic magnet which comes through the brain, okay? Isn't that neat? <laughs> they won't teach you this in medical school, by the way. Okay, so you understand we need to get that calcium in the body because what happens is that the body can form a cell up to this point, but it's a very watery, incomplete cell. And then it needs to get, draw calcium from your metabolic or from your reserve system to start the cell so it can complete 
This might be a liver cell, might be a kidney cell. Sometimes guys even develop heart cells. <laughs> so you understand this is how it works. And in order to get that process to work, the more calcium your body has to work with, the closer your pH would be to 6.4. Okay. Any questions on how we get that pH moving to where we want it? Let's talk about the urine saliva a little bit. One of the things he used for the urine saliva to build up the gastric juices was the lemon and water. That was his primary digestive aid, and that's why he didn't have to use a whole lot of uh, hydrochloric acid and things of this nature. Another thing he used to build up gastric juices was a product called ferrotonic. It's a lot like this mineral water out here that they sell, okay? This Clark water, this John Ray water. Swamp juice. Okay? But he only had people taking like two or three drops of that a day. That's all he would have them on. No, Willard water is different. Hmm? The green the green fog, yeah. No, I said Willard water and this mineral water are not the same. Willard water just makes water wetter, that's all it does. The catalyst. Yeah, basically by running, did I cover that in this class or not? You have, you have dry water, which is round, okay, because of high surface tension. That water is not biologically active. It will not go through the, the semi-permeable membranes of the, of the cells. What you want is wet water, which when you put it on a surface will lay flat. There's, you see, this surface tension will bind the water you want to break that binding force in the water so that when water lays flat, it will go through the semi-permeable membranes in the body. You can do that by running the water through a quartz, over a quartz crystal. The quartz crystal will take this from like 72 dynes of tension down to maybe 50 or 60 dynes of tension. And you'll end up with wet water. That's what Willard water did, okay? It broke the surface tension to, so you ended up with wet water instead of dry water. It makes it biologically more active. Okay. Next thing we'll do is we'll talk about the salts right here. How do you get the salts down? Distilled water. Distilled water. You need you need more water until you get it down to six to seven C. <laughs> okay. Even with the wetter water, it just happens faster. Okay. <laughs> Things just happen quicker when you have dry or uh, wet water versus dry water. Okay. The maintenance dose is whatever keeps it here at six C. Okay. That'll be different in each and every person. Okay. See, these numbers will tell you what you have to do. That's the neat thing about the system. Another thing, sometimes I found that people were running low down here and they were having trouble getting salt out of the system. And the best thing I ever found for kicking the kidneys in is pineapple. Just get them a, just 
small can of this pineapple, Gold's pineapple, just eat it. And you can see them salt shoot up right away as it kicks the kidneys in. Uh, basically, if, if you're on a steady amount of water, and okay, let's say you're sitting down here, people were like at 30 when you first met them, you got it down, they're running about 14, and they're on the same amount of water, the same diet, and all of a sudden it drops, hits up to 28. What happens? We well, see what happens, the body and the muscle tissue store salt. And when you get the salt level down, it'll dump a whole bunch of salt back in the system. No, I'm talking about all salt. But see, the body, it, it will, if there's a, because we have so much salt in our system, okay, the body will protect itself by moving some of the salt into the muscle tissue to protect itself. No, it won't work. You put potassium in there, you, I'll show you how a potassium deficiency shows up here shortly. So what happens is when you bring your electrolyte down in your body, all of a sudden your body says, darn, I can get rid of some of this stored salt. And it'll dump a whole bunch of salt in the system. And then all of a sudden, you know, you've been on this diet, you've been drinking your water, your salts are coming down, all of a sudden they're up about 20 or 30 again. Okay, all that happened is the body just dumped a whole lot of, bunch of stored salt. You know, insulin, all these salts, they're, so, they're stored back up in the body. So that's actually a good sign when that happens. And you regulate that by the water, right? Distilled water, 50 micromoles with quartz crystal in it. A lot of times I'll put a silver coin in there to add silver to it because silver is real good for the body. Get you one of those 99.99 .99 fine coins, put it in your water jar, and that'll, that really inhib inhibits infection. And salt is never, or silver is never toxic to the human body except in bullet form. <laughs> okay. And if the salt's, okay, if somebody's up here and they drop below six, I would probably just have them stop taking less water, okay, and it should come back up. Well, silver in a homeopathic is different than silver in a metallic. Well, a lot of that was mercury. They quicksilver. Quicksilver is mercury. And they did have problems with that. Now the dishes had silver around them to protect them from uh, well, a blue blood basically refers to people who you can see their veins in, from what I understand. Normally if there's a blue cast of your skin, you're not getting enough oxygen. Okay, why weren't they getting enough oxygen? I bet you if you test their salts, they were sitting up here at 30 or 40, okay? I've taken massive of dose of silver, and I've never noticed the contraindication. Massive amount. On lots of people, and I've never seen a contraindication yet. Pardon me, I can't hear. I, w I would much rather eat off of silverware than I would aluminumware. Okay. But the thing is, you want to get your salts down to where the body's electrical system can function at its peak of performance, okay? Which is 6C or 7C, okay? That's where you want it. And when you when you're like
like Ed, you can tolerate almost any poison in your body, and you know things just don't bother you. Okay. Now we get into the undigested proteins, or the, over here the ureas. Basically, these will read real high. Okay. You normally want these numbers to run together. Okay. The further these numbers get apart the more you're dealing with a potassium deficiency. The further they're apart, the more you're dealing with a potassium deficiency. For instance, let's say the top number is reading like, say, 5. The bottom number is reading 12. That's a severe potassium deficiency. Just under, we're just under ureas now, OK? And the bottom number is very indicative of the colon. The higher the bottom number, the dirtier the colon. Pardon me? Yeah, the greater the spread, the more you're dealing with a potassium deficiency. Normally it's on top. Very seldom do you ever see the bottom low. Almost nobody has a clean colon. If you need toilet paper, you don't have a clean colon. Okay, the ureas are directly also related to bad digestion, bad kidneys, dirty colon. Basically, these will be high in most of the people you deal with, all right? And you want to keep them fairly high because if a urea or a protein has been in the body, when it first dumps into the bloodstream, it's uh, a soluble salt, okay? It's been in there for over three days. It becomes an insoluble salt, which adds a lot of problems to the heart, which causes a lot of cholesterol problems, which causes uh, the, the heart to function. The blood can't work at the capillary sites very good, and the whole body just uh, stops functioning. Basically, in a soluble form, it, it's something that the body can handle. When it's insoluble, the body can't handle it. They're ureas. Basically, I'm saying that most proteins in the body are soluble. And when they hit the bloodstream, they will stay soluble for about three days. But if they're not removed in three days, they become insoluble. And then they become harder to get rid of, and they become, uh, they cause the blood to thicken, and they cause the heart to work hard, and it's one of the major causes of crib death. It should be it should be soluble, but if it's in the body for longer than three days, it becomes insoluble. So what happens? First of all, when you check somebody, chances are their urea is going to be up here around 20 or 30, okay? And as they begin to drink the water, take the minerals, what happens is that the, the combined number is going to drop, okay? And then what happens is it will automatically raise again, okay? But when you first do a screening, you can, you can count that most of the ureas that high will be insoluble. And then after you get rid of them, then you're going to be dealing with soluble type ureas, those the body can handle. Okay, and, if they're, and basically if this number is high, the higher the bottom number, the dirtier the colon, okay?
those basically will come down and also it's an indication that you're dealing with another way to bring them down is with magnesium okay let's say somebody's stuck up here in the high 20s okay that's when I would give somebody magnesium supplements because magnesium will neutralize the uh, nitrogen it'll break up the uh, nitrogen molecule turn it into a gas which will probably come up through the, through the lungs then. Uh, one of the forms he used was dolomite, a good grade dolomite. And the rule I normally use, if you can see foam in your urine, you probably need it. If you can't see foam, you probably don't. The other dolomites are extremely soluble and you can overdo them real easy. What happens if you take too much dolomite these numbers here will begin to separate and you'll end up with a severe potassium deficiency which causes brain tumors and Alzheimer's disease. That's another problem. So basically, if, you're, you know, if people are sitting here within this realm, you don't have to give them magnesium, okay? If they're above that realm, yeah, I would. Get it to where the body can pump it and handle it real good. That's uh, the calcium magnesium myth. <laughs> what have calcium and magnesium got to do with each other? Nothing. Calcium and phosphorus work together, I agree. But magnesium, I've seen more damage done by magnesium probably than any other element out there when it's used improperly. Because excess magnesium will interfere with uh, anionic protein digestion which is potassium. And the brain feeds on more potassium than any other organ in the body. So when I'm screening somebody and, uh, and I see this happening, I says, Dad, do you have trouble remembering stuff? Well, let me think. I can't remember. <laughs> That's a primary example. And then I'll ask them, well, are you on magnesium? Well, yeah, lots of it. First thing you do is get them off of it. You've got to get these two numbers back together again Okay, so that, the, so that the potassium can become available to the brain and the body. Sure, and they're, they're putting iron in your cereal, too. Why are they putting iron in your, so in your cereal? Because iron promotes bacterial growth. <laughs> sure. When I was in the oil field, I mean, we'd have these pipes, you know, three miles down in the ground, and uh, iron-reducing bacteria would eat three miles of pipe in a month. And what they found in animals is that when an infection occurs in an animal, the body will pull the iron out of the body to stop the infection. So what are they doing? They're pumping them full of iron. Keep the bugs going. Same with magnesium. If you don't have any foam on your urine, don't take any magnesium. And if you do the numbers, and if these numbers here total less than 10, don't take any magnesium. Or if you've got a wide spread in them, don't take any magnesium, okay? Basically, what they're doing is now that everybody caught on to what calcium is, <laughs> now they're making sure the calcium don't work by having you not take any phosphorus. And they're, you know, they're, they're pushing calcium magnesium, but technically they don't have anything to do with each other. The only thing magnesium does in a free form in the body is regulate the uh, nitrogen content of the blood. That's all it does. The 
If you get too much of it, you're going to interfere, interfere with the protein digestion, especially the anionic protein digestion is where your potassiums come from. And that'll affect the ticker or the uh, thinker up there. Okay, be careful on that. Here's a chart I got from somebody that basically is just a fairly good overlay, okay, of what I've been talking about. They have it broke down into the zones, the A, B, C zone, where the numbers are, and it'll give you some idea, okay, of what's going on in the body. Basically, when these ureas get above 19, you're dealing with nitrogen toxicity in the body, okay? The blood becomes very viscous. You have a lot of problems. And if they begin to drop real low, that's even worse yet. But very seldom do I, you should have a handout somewhere on there with that on it. But basically it's a good overlay to give you a, a quick reference to what's going on in the body. The main thing I use is this sheet right here on body chemistry. Okay, the numbers we get with what they call the, uh, the urea testing kit. They're in here. Okay, you have a test tube, and in your kit you get what they call universal extracting fluid. You put six drops of the extracting fluid in a test tube, and one drop of urine. Then what you do is you take your test tube or your uh, eyedropper and you mix it up real good for about a minute, okay? Then, then you have your uh, basic solution to test. Then you have this, you get a, a spot well plate. And you have these test solutions. You have a nitrate test solution and you have an ammoniacal test solution. You put four drops of the nitrate in the well four drops of the uh, ammoniacal in the well, and then one drop of the uh, extract in each well, okay? Then what happens, this forms on there, okay? In the spot well. And that's how we determine where the nitrates are, okay? The top well will give you the nitrate numbers, the bottom well will give you the ammoniacal nitrate numbers. Add them together. That'll give you that'll give you this number here. Okay. These two added together equals six. Or these two added together will give you these. But I'm telling you also, look at those two numbers. Okay. If they're even, everything's okay. But if they start to spread, you're looking at a severe potassium deficiency. You need to seriously look at that. Oh, what he recommended basically was uh, he had people on a uh, hominy. You know what hominy is? Because you take white corn, you soak it in potassium hydroxide, which gives it a whole lot of potassium. Sardines are another one that is extremely rich in or is salmon. I think the sardines are real rich in uh, potassium also. Plus, I also use potassium hydroxide, <laughs> you know, one or two drops a day. That's some potent stuff. But you can also use the juice that's in the uh, hominy for an excellent potassium source. That's potassium hydroxide. Okay, some of the other things that he used as supplements to help these along was uh, he used seaweed a lot. He had people taking seaweed. Huh? 
you know, for overall numbers. He liked the Norwegian kelp probably the most. And normally you have people, and that's also a, a good source of potassium also. But there's a lot of trace minerals in good Norwegian kelp. So you normally have people on a supplement of that also, okay, of the, uh, of the kelp. When we first started people on a program, another herb he liked getting people on was chaparral. Because he said chaparral helped the body throw out all the dead cells. It helped the body to... Uh, do these things faster. And it helps build reserve energy, okay? Not enough calcium. Not enough. Not enough to do the job. Is what? But he did use, as on a regular basis, people did use the kelps, okay, to help maintain the mineral content in the body, okay, but not calcium. You've got to supplement. You know, you cannot really understand the severity of calcium until you've been in agriculture for about 10 years. I mean, there just ain't none in anything anymore. It ain't there. Hmm? There's no weight to anything. There's no, it ain't there. How do you, and if you can get somebody's pH to move, okay, the way I told you, I have no problem with it. But I've been doing this for 30 years, and I've never seen it happen. I go by the numbers. Them numbers don't lie. You know? Okay, another thing that he liked using is comfrey, especially if people had sugar problems, okay? It seems that the comfrey also helped regulate the sugar. And as a rule, if your sugar is less than 1.5 or less, don't use it. Because if your sugar is 1.5 or less, you could draw the sugars down low and cause a problem. Pardon me? Why does it do it? I just know it moves the sugar. He said it was the chlorophyll in there that did it. Okay. And if you get too much chlorophyll, it'll make the owls of Langerhans overactive and actually put out too much insulin and basically cause you to go into a deficiency in insulin. I mean in sugar, I'm sorry. Again, dolomite, okay, is a, is a port is a, that he used basically to help bring the ureas down. But if you have a potassium deficiency, okay, where the numbers, if your total ureas, okay, are less than 15, or if you see a spread in there, you don't use it. Because then you can end up with the other problems, okay? Normally they go by the lead content. The lower the lead content, the better it is. What I've been using is daily, the daily manufacturing company. Normally, I don't know, basically people like Solgar and those people have good high quality stuff also. Okay, gold seal was another thing he used to help bring that as a blood purifier, but he would, and, and to help the kidneys but he'd only use it on people who had a high pH, okay, above 6.4, because there's a lot of sulfur in golden seal. And if somebody's acid, it can drive them in the wrong direction. 
You could purify the blood, but you could kill the patient. <laughs> and he never used it for more than 30 days at any one time. Right. Never over 30 days at one time, even in a high pH. Okay. Okay, another product he used was a product called KM. <laughs> KM was 50% soft rock phosphate and 50% diatomaceous earth. Okay, it was 50% soft rock phosphate, i.e., you know, the stuff we made before, and 50% diatomaceous earth, DE as we call it. That is the best wormer you can ever take. Wormer. Humans and animals. Yeah. And, the, and the soft rock phosphate and the mint coal mixed together. DE is good by itself, okay? But DE mixed with soft rock phosphate is even better yet. It seems when you mix the two together, it, 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 it will keep you worm free. And people who have had salmonella or people who had trichinosis, they would have to take this substance the rest of their life to keep those uh, pork worms under control. I can't hear you. Okay, basically, what's the cause for strokes and paralysis? High salts, high ureas. Okay, because I've never heard of KM causing that. Oh, you're you're talking about the the the, uh, the multi-level KM. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I got you. Thank you. No, this KM I am talking or K-min, Okay, is what I'm talking about. This KM is good, right? Yeah, but KM, okay, if, if you can keep the salts down, keep the ureas in range, it'll never be a problem, okay? Because strokes and heart attacks only occur at elevated ureas and elevated salts, period. Okay? But this KMIN, okay, will keep you worm-free, I take it all the time, and if uh, give it to your dog, your cat, your birds, everybody gets it. Because if one's got worms, they all got worms. <laughs> Problem with worming is we go in there and we kill all the worms, and the next thing we know, what? The next day they're hatching out and the cycle starting all over again. So whenever you're on a worming program, you have to go for a minimum of 30 days so that you get the complete cycle of the hatching. I would probably go 60 days in case you find an egg that just happens to hatch out later on, too. Pardon me? People with trichinosis who put on that the rest of their life so that they could keep the trichinosis under control, yes. Not according to that technology, no. <laughs> you could just keep it under control. There's a chemical analysis of uh, DE. 
interesting. It's got traces of uh, gallium, uh, titanium, zirconium, strontium. So there's a lot more in it than just, you know, the silica. So it is a good trace mineral to take also. Okay, the lime water, we covered that. Min coal. Basically, there's two types of diatomaceous earth. You have the acid treated and the water treated. The acid treated is the one that goes into the filters that they use. The water, or the sun-dried water, is what we normally like, like the permagard. And you just take the dry stuff, mix it with the uh, min coal, that's all you do. One-to-one -one basis. That's all it is. A cup of min coal, a cup of DE, you mix it, you have your wife put it in capsules. <laughs> her girlfriend or... <laughs> How can you girls are laughing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Interest interesting thing. Vitamin B1 and B2, if people are overweight, you really don't want to put them on there because it will increase their, at, their appetite. B6 is used a lot when you have numbingness or tingling in the body, like carpal tunnel, tingling in the body or nerve problems. Mm -hmm. Is what? Niacin? Nisetol. That I don't know right offhand. It's a part of a B complex, but I couldn't say offhand. No, no. But if there's any problems, uh, basically anywhere in the nervous system, you need B6. B6 supplement. Actually, one of the best I've run across is uh, from uh, your buddy there uh, in uh, Daly. He has an activated B6. It's probably the best one there is. Interesting thing, B12 is another thing that helps build red blood cells, okay? The problem is getting a B12 to be accepted by the body. If you study certain companies, they say there's an X factor involved which makes it become available to the body. You know what that X factor is? Gelatin. <laughs> okay. Couldn't say whether it's a synthetic or not. I don't think it is, is it? I personally inject it right into the body myself. It's still the best. Yeah, they mix it with gelatin to make it work. <laughs> when you get into the research, that's what they do. Yeah, make it work because gelatin will neutralize the charge in the gut so it'll go through. Okay, vitamin C. If somebody is very alkaline, okay, above 6.4, you can use the ascorbic acid. If they're below 6.4, you, you can use the, the mineral ascorbates, but not the ascorbic acid because it'll compound the problem. Yeah, that's a mineral. That's what they call a mineral ascorbate. You see, you have ascorbic, which is a radical, acid, which is hydrogen, and then you can have ascorbic calcium, ascorbic potassium, ascorbic magnesium. So what they do is they take the ascorbic radical, and instead of tying it to hydrogen, which makes it an acid, they tie it to calcium, 
which is good. But if somebody is alkaline, okay, ascorbic acid is the best one to take. If somebody is alkaline, or I mean, if they're if they're acid, wait, well, let me go through that again. Okay, if they're alkaline, ascorbic acid is the best one to take. If they're acid, then the mineral ascorbates are the best to take. Okay. B12 basically just helps the cells rebuild faster. So, right. It ain't our food. <laughs> and B12, huh? Okay, uh, basically, she can't understand why B12 is so deficient. It's deficient for two reasons, okay? Number one, it ain't in our food. And number two, when we do take it, if you don't have this, the uh, gelatin lining the gut, it won't get through. You can't absorb it, okay? Are we talking about B12? No, it can't go through it. Okay, yesterday I talked a little bit about the importance of gelatin, right? Okay, when you eat gelatin, the first gelatin you eat will be go into the blood, it will go into the marrow of the bone to make to make marrow, okay, for red blood cells. If there's any gelatin left over, it'll precipitate into the joints to make ligaments and tendons. If there's any jello left over, it'll go make nails and hooks. If there's any left over, it'll be secreted back into the colon. And that is the natural lubricant for the colon. Okay, the colon needs to be lubricated. And nature designed the, gel uh, the gelatinous protein for that job because it will not harbor bacteria and it will pass the charges through it. Okay, so if, you're, if you don't have enough gelatin in your body, your body will secrete another form of protein, which is not as good as gelatin, to line the colon. That's what we call mucus. It will harbor bacteria, and it won't pass the charges through it. Pardon me? A leaky gut, are you talking about the valves that are leaking between the large and small intestines or what? Little holes in them. I would say the first thing I would put them on would probably be uh, gelatin. Sure. See, a lot of times people will say, well, uh, if you to help the gut, you need things like psyllium holes. Okay, the reason they work is because they're high in gelatin. Uh, okra is high in gelatin. Uh, prune juice will help move the gut because it's high in gelatin. How do you know when you have enough gelatin in your body? <laughs> you don't need any toilet paper. Okay. Can we absorb the gelatin from the Sure. Never ever take jello or psyllium or any of these things without water. Because otherwise it'll ball up in there and then they'll have to go in there and cut it out. Okay? Prune juice. What I do is I, I boil up water in the morning and put about an ounce of prune juice in the hot water. That stuff is available right now. Okay? So it's a good substitute for coffee drinkers too, by the way. It will satisfy that coffee urge. <laughs> yeah. Whatever you like. I put about an ounce in a cup of water. Because prune juice would probably be too concentrated and I don't like it. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a type O and I can't eat aloe. Okay.
You want me to go through the whole system again? Okay, the, the main, you know, see, Jell-O has got a lot of cobalt, molly, and the heavy elements that are necessary for bone marrow. So the bone marrow will take priority as it goes into the body. And if there's any gelatin left, it'll precipitate down through the through the joints. Okay, that's what'll keep your 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 shoulder in socket. Okay, and it'll give your ligaments and tendons their muscle or their their strength. If there's any length from that, it'll go down and it'll give you fingernails. So if you got a fingernail problem, it could be a gelatin deficiency. Another thing I use is that permanganate for fingernails, you know. That will get rid of the fingernail fungus, the permanganate. What? Well, potassium permanganate. K-M-N-O-4, I believe it is. And it's, it's uh, basically it's a crystalline structure that I use it in my survival classes <laughs> because if I mix it to this light pink consistency, I can drink swamp water. If I get it a little darker, I can use it for uh, an antiseptic. If I get it darker yet, I can use it for a fungicide. No. This is, copa this is for on the body, this is for drinking, okay. and or bathtub. And what that will do, that's one of nature's best fungicides there is. Yeah, I know, I use it for candida. Because I, my own personal, okay, this is some of my own work. I personally think candida is a manganese deficiency, myself, okay? And the people that I put on it, the candida went away. I drink it, okay, in the light pink, and then you can put it on in the darker color uh, on the body, okay? Both. Bathe in it, too. So far, I haven't seen it to be a problem in septic systems yet, and I've used a lot of it. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, I've been using it in a, on a septic system now for about six months, and it doesn't seem to be a problem. If it does, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I've been using it so far. I haven't had a problem. But you see, nature has basically three fungicides that it uses. It uses copper, boron, and manganese. These are nature's fungicides. If you're low on any one of these trees, you could have a fungus in the body. I think they put some gelatin with that B12 under the tongue. That's why it works, okay? Okay, another uh, vitamin that he, well, I talked about vitamin D already, right? The more acid you are, the more you need it. Another one uses vitamin E. Basically, what vitamin E does is thin the blood. That's what it does. All the benefits that are derived from it are basically derived because it thins the blood. For an adult over 140 pounds, use about a thousand units. Basically, I prefer the fish oils myself. I use a lot of cod liver oil. I really like it. <laughs> Good for you.
Basically, he used a lot of prune juice, too, for people who were especially alkaline, especially for people who tended to be constipated. And one of the things he did is he diluted it with hot water so that it worked better than if it was concentrated. Okay, now acid does, uh, basically you might want to add just a pinch of baking soda to it if you're acid. Green drink I talked about before and how you help do that to control the sugar. And I would use the book Eat Right for Your Type to help, you know, pick the proper one so that you don't get any problems. He used a lot of carrot juice too, but do not use carrots, okay? If you got sugar problems. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, if your sugar basically is above six, I probably five five. I wouldn't use it because carrot juice is loaded with sugar. They're natural sugars, but if you let's say your sugar is above five five, you got a sugar problem already. You don't need to add it more to it. If your sugar level was real low, it would probably help you a whole lot, okay? Because it is really high in uh, sugar. Another thing he uses is cranberry juice. Cranberry juice is real rich in manganese, okay? It's good for any reproductive problems that people might have. But again, pri uh, basically, uh, cranberry juice is acid, so you take the same rule. You add a little baking soda to it. And uh, basically what you normally do is if you, you, you dilute the cranberry juice 50-50 with water, you'll get a lot more out of your juices if you dilute them back than if you drink them straight because your gastric juices don't have to work as hard if you dilute it back with water. It's like if you buy Ocean Spray Cranberry, dilute it back 50-50 with water. If you're acid, you know, if you're below like 5-6 or something, add a little pinch of baking soda to it. You get high. <laughs> you're only drinking maybe four to six ounces a day, not a whole lot. Okay, back in those days, too, for we didn't have the mineral ascorbate. So if we wanted to get vitamin C into the body, we basically had people take fresh onion soup. Fresh onion soup is probably the richest source of vitamin uh, C from foods that you can take. A lot of people are allergic to pepper, so he didn't use them. But he found that vitamin C, especially for people that were acid, was a very good way to get vitamin C in the body. Very rich source of vitamin C. The onion soup was the best way to do it. Another very interesting thing is a lot of people are cold all the time. Body temperature is low. And basically what he found that, that alcohol in the body regulates body temperature. If you're cold all the time, you don't have enough alcohol in your system. If you're hot all the time, you have too much alcohol in your system. And he found that basically there was two types of uh, alcohol that were identical to the alcohol made in your pancreas in your body. One of them was Manischewitz dry conquered wine. And the other was beef eater gin. <laughs> if you're cold, yes. <laughs> and I'm only talking now maybe an ounce, okay, and you sip it slowly. 
<laughs> you know, we're not going to turn this into a social occasion. This is medicine. <laughs> but those are basically two alcohols that are identical to the alcohol that's produced by your pancreas, which helps regulate temperature. Hot flashes, that's a different problem. Okay, the antagonistic chemical towards alcohol is coffee. Manischewitz dry conquered and or beef eaters gin. You want to keep the temperature about 98.6. Okay. If you're too cold, you need, you need to. If, you, if your temperature is cold all the time, read the book on Broda Barnes, okay, called Your Thyroid. You've got to do it. And then incorporate that technology along with this technology, and you'll cure it. Or at least you'll make it better. So if you're warm all the time, maybe drink you're coffee. Neutral. If you're warm all the time, it could be because you're producing too much alcohol in your system. Probably one of the main culprits is potatoes, starches, sugar, yeah. And one of the antidotes for too much alcohol, the, the, the antidote for calcium in the body is alcohol. The antidote for alcohol is coffee. <laughs> Another thing he used basically was uh, royal jelly, basically for joint problems, for people that had problems in the joint. This royal jelly or the queen's je the queen bee's jelly, very good for joint problems. Yeah. Well, if the bee is alive, there's still hope. <laughs> Another thing in his clinic, he basically. Uh, did was colonics all the time. And towards the end there, they were starting to inject oxygen into the colonics. And then uh, now they've even in they inject uh, ozone into the colonics to make it really good. Because uh, that'll help bring down those ureas, and the body will uh, basically heal a lot faster if you do that. Okay, I tried to keep this as pure radio, uh, pure uh, as I could, <laughs> without getting off into tangents because this is what he taught. Okay, so I ready to take a break. Testing that thing is because you can get the test equipment from Pike. And in there, he'll tell you exactly how to use the urea test kits, how to use a conductivity meter. Well, maybe we ought to go through it and show you. On the first page, I think this is my last one, and I'll hand that out as soon as I'm done. Okay. Here's one right here. On the first page, you have basically the refractometers. And I told you the one I like, the N1E. This is probably still one of the best ones for the money. Then you go a little lower and you have the conductivity meters. Now you can go with the more expensive meter like the DC4 if you're going to set up in a laboratory. But if you're going to go in a cheaper setup, you can go like with a DS. I would get the DISTWP4. It only goes up to 19,000 micromoles of conductivity, but if you've got to go higher, 
you just dilute the, the urine back one to one and double your answer. So, you know, you can do that. pH testers, you can get pH meters, but if you get a meter, you have to get uh, solutions to uh, calibrate it. Buffer solution to calibrate. Because you have to calibrate these meters all the time. I use pH paper, I probably, I use pH paper 90% of the time to get the job done. Meters are nice, but normally to use meters you need laboratory conditions to use a meter. I stick this in my shirt pocket and go with pH paper. This is range 5.5 five to 8. This is specially made for Reams testing equipment, okay? Bob Pike here. See, Pike was one of Reams' students, okay? And if you pump him, he'll tell you. Now, this is one of the pieces. He's got a. Yeah, it's hard to do spit with a meter, okay? Would you fill this cup with spit? <laughs> Okay, then you can go to, uh, where's that pH? He's got, uh, okay, on page five, animal urea test kits. I'll tell you what you really need. You need basically the extracting fluid. You need the nitrate test solution and the ammonia test solution, okay? Right. And right behind it, you have the nitrate test solution, the ammonia test solution, and then you need the urea color cards. That's all you really need. That's, that's your complete urea test kit, okay? It's on page five. You don't need the chemical for pH, okay? You, you waste your money on all that stuff. But basically all you need is the extracting fluid, the two extracting solutions, and the test color chart. Right here, okay? And then right below it you have the pH test stripes, or test strips. That's for pH papers right here that are specifically designed for Reams testing. They're between 5.5 five and 8. Then you need a refractometer and a conductivity meter and a shingle. <laughs> <laughs> and don't go on to 6 o'clock news and say, I can cure cancer. <laughs> then, you'll, then we'll have to have a legal class. <laughs> Okay, all the test equipment you need is right here from Bob Pike. You need a good refractometer. Now that refractometer can be used on vegetables too. You also got a handout. Okay, basically all you need is you need the vegetable. Squeeze some juice on the uh, prism of the refractometer, close it, and read it right off the scale. Here's the chart. Okay, you want to, let's say you got some uh, apples, okay? A poor apple would be about six, okay? A good apple would read 18 or plus. Have I, between organic, most organic people grow poor quality than chemical people. I work with farmers. A good farmer has cows in the, in the barn that are 18 years old. A 
The bed farmer, has far, uh, his average age is about 3.5 years old. So we know the good, you know, based on the food that those cows eat, we, you know, we learn what's good and what ain't. And uh, the food that I recommend is food that's grown properly. I still use the Reams method for growing food. There are some chemicals we use because in uh, the decomposition of the soil, for instance, ammonium or calcium or ammonium sulfate is a byproduct of bacterial decomposition. Well, the organic people say we can't use that because it's a chemical. But damn right it's a chemical. It's the same chemical that's produced out there in the field through natural decomposition. So the organic people limit us on what we can do to grow good crops. Okay? So I, I'm not for labels. What I there there is some tests around here that are we call tissue analysis tests, okay, or feed feed analysis tests. So what I say you run the feed analysis and that'll separate the men from the boys. And you don't need a crowbar. <laughs> So I don't like putting words on there that aren't defined, okay? This refractometer will tell you whether it's any good or not, okay? Okay, down here, orange. A good orange will have a BRICS reading of 20 plus. A bad orange will be six or less. There is no way you can cheat me with a refractometer, okay? Basically, tomatoes, potatoes, anything that you can squeeze juice out of, you can, you can analyze. That's why I have it. And I find out that plants need minerals. If you don't give them the mineral, you don't have the quality. What's number one mineral? God dang, we're learning. <laughs> Quick. So if you get a refractometer, you know, not only that, does anybody have any particular type of animal they want to know the, the rates for? You want to know what a horse could be? Well, one guy holding them while the other guy gets the urine. <laughs> <laughs> you will run Clinton, you'll find out. Okay, on a horse, the sugar should read between 12 and 20. Okay, what he's saying, it should read 12 in the summer, 20 in winter. Okay, the pH of a horse is 9-0 over... Nine zero, okay. The sugar con or the uh, conductivity of a horse should be eighteen in summer, twenty in winter. Oh wait a minute, I'm sorry. Hold off here. It should be uh, eighteen to twenty in winter, ten in summer. Okay. There should be absolutely no debris. Yes, in the winter. You want it between 10 and 18 and 20 in the summer, which means that a horse needs a lot of salt in the summer. In the winter time, you don't want to give him any salt. Okay, that's what we're saying. This would be summer, winter. Absolutely no debris in the urine. Okay. Point zero M. Twelve in the summer, twenty in the winter. Okay, the urea should be about nineteen over nineteen. This is a bricks reading, right? The bricks. That's the sugar. That's that would be the the sugar in the urine.
1.5 in people. Horses should be 12 and 20. No. This is pH reading right here. Sugar and bricks, same thing, yes. Yeah, this is all types of sugar. On a, on a refractometer, you get the glucose, the sucrose, and any other coast they got in there. Well, actually, I should be real accurate. Well, yeah, let's just say 19 over 19. The top urea should be 19, the bottom urea should be also be 19. Dog, I might have to look that up. So you understand the frequency of a horse is a lot different. Well, I guess I don't have a dog. Okay, and the same rules apply to the horse, okay? What happens if you do a horse and it's running about nine on sugar? What are you going to do? Put some sugar in his feed, right? What happens if the pH is running, the urine pH is, say, running at, say, maybe 10? What are you going to feed him? A little vinegar, bring it back down, okay? Salt's pretty obvious. You don't want to run the salt very high. If I go by a field and I see a horse standing there like this, I know two things are wrong in the winter. Number one, he ain't getting enough sugar to combat the heat, or he's got too much salt in his system, where you need the salt in the summertime. See, in the winter, we, they need more sugar, less salt. Now, in the wintertime, they need the sugar and less salt. Summertime, they need less sugar and more salt, okay? So there, there is a difference. You get that horse to those numbers, you got yourself a perfectly healthy horse. Because their frequency is different, therefore their diet's different, their numbers are different. Yeah, animals, because they have, see, the more complicated the individual, the more complicated the diet. Just for instance, the frequency of a man would be that's the frequency of a man. This is the frequency of a woman. Zero, 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 0000024 is the frequency of a man. A woman is zero, 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 0000026. Frequency. This is how many times, this, this is their frequency. This is how many times they vibrate per second. First people, yeah. Okay, a horse would be. A male horse would be zero 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 forty four. A female horse would be zero 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 forty six. Huh? No, they got one less zero than we do. They're less complicated. That's why they can live on grass all their life and we can't. Now, citrus would be, they're even simpler yet. See, the, 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 the lower the, the frequency of, an, of, a, of a, an entity, the simpler the diet. Mm -hmm. Insects are probably between a citrus and a horse, or even, it could be either way. I know bacteria, you know, you get down to, like this, 
viruses you get down to like that, you know, one zero. So the simpler the life form, the simpler the diet. But man is the most complex organism right now on the planet, so, and we have the most complex diet because we vibrate faster than anybody else. We vibrate more times a second than, say, a horse does, okay? Okay. Let's say you did a hair analysis and there's too much calcium in it. Remember I told you that there's a whole bunch of calciums? If you're acid and you take calcium lactate, it's going to end up in the hair. All right? It's the wrong kind. Well, so yeah, it would be old, but it's still, the, the principle is that basically you can have too much of one calcium and not enough of another. So you can have excess in the body where you're getting deposits in the joint and you can be deficient and, and basically on the other end and having bone deterioration all at the same time. Basically by changing the form your body would have no need to get rid of it through the hair. See the body uses the hair as a dumping ground. If it has too much of it a lot of times it'll push it out through the hair. Sometimes a little hair is with it. <laughs> Everything has weaknesses, and I personally would go through, just like I said, the blood analysis is no good for calcium. Hair analysis is no good for calcium. There's only one thing that I've ever found that was good for calcium, and that is the pH test. It's the only indication we can tell whether we're deficient in calcium or not. Hair, basically, would probably the traces would be good. I think, personally, if they would analyze the protein in the hair, uh, they could come up with very good protein, whether, what proteins we're low in and what we aren't. I mean, that'd be a waste of time and money. I'd do oats. You want to build the soil, the best thing you can plow down is oats. The best way to do it is plant the oats in the spring when it gets above about 12 inches, mow it with a sickle bar and leave it lay. It'll grow up to 12 inches, cut it with a sickle bar and let it lay. And then in fall, when it comes up, plow the whole mess under. See, when a plant is below 12 inches, it's drawing heavy on the air. After that, it begins to draw on the ground. So ideally, if you, I've done a lot of testing this way, and by soil testing and by yields, and by seed analysis, the fastest way you can draw a field of soil is by using oats. The next best thing I would probably use would be uh, castor beans. If you can't use castor beans, then use next use motor oil with sawdust and throw it out in the field. You build the oil. That's how you build the oil content of the soil what's called soil protoplasm. These environmentals cause more damage than harm, trust me. I can double the, the oil content in a plant by doing these things. Quietly, of course. If you want to build a soil, use oats. I don't like soybeans. The guy could have done it three times faster with oats. How about rye? Rye is one of the worst cover crops you can use. <laughs> One thing, it can get away from you. Basically, if you sure. use rye after you plow it under, you've got to wait several weeks for the ground to readjust itself 
so you can get your seed to germinate. Right. Well, your rice crop could be going in our stomachs, not in our. Okay, the motor oil and sawdust, you want to get it about to the consistency of, of, uh, of uh, sweeping compound, put it on in fall. Don't put it on in spring, otherwise it'll take too much nitrogen out of your crop. Use motor oil. Best fertilizer in the world. Use motor oil and sawdust. And sawdust. Use it on the soil. Put it on the soil, yeah. In fall. Five hundred pounds per acre is about the heaviest I'd want to go. An acre is two hundred and twenty feet by two hundred and twenty feet. I use the lead for fertilizer. Okay. Are we done? Then let me show you something here. If I have six thousand pounds of calcium per acre, I could I probably need about forty pounds of copper. Okay. If I have three thousand pounds of calcium out there, I only need twenty pounds of copper. 40 pounds would be toxic. <laughs> if I only had 15 pounds, uh, 1,500 pounds of lime, of calcium in the soil, I'd only need 10 pounds of copper. 20 pounds would be toxic. What's a toxin? Something you got too much of, okay? But you understand, 10 pounds of copper would be an imbalance of 1,500 pounds of lime in the field. 10 pounds of copper would be a deficiency at 6,000 pounds of lime per acre, okay? Conversely, 40 pounds of copper would be ideal if I had 6,000 pounds of lime out there, but would be highly toxic if I only had 1,500 pounds of lime out there. So how do I get rid of toxins in the soil? Add lime. <laughs> Damn. Now, there's, there's, there's the big argument the I know. Right. They yeah. can't. You can't. That's the difference. Huh? They can't. You can't. People don't understand balance, okay? I hear everybody talk about balance, but nobody ever explains to me what it is and how it changes. Huh? Right. You see, if I put 40 pounds of, of copper out on the field with only 1,500, calcium is the regulator. Everything is in relation to calcium. Okay? If I only had 1,500 pounds, yeah, that 10 would be good out there. But if I put 30 pounds out there, man, I'd have a toxic condition. But if I got 6,000 pounds of lime in my field, hell, I could put 40 pounds out there and I'd, I'd, be, I'd have a hell of a crop. Okay? The same is true in the body. The more calcium you have in the body, the less toxic the stuff is in the body. All right? Same song, second verse. All right? <laughs> Are you beginning to understand the importance of calcium? The more calcium I have in the body, the more of everything else I need. So what actually is toxic now will become food later on. <laughs> right? See, I would never recommend putting uh, motor oil and sawdust on somebody that didn't put lime out there because it would be toxic if they didn't. Okay? About the consistency of sweeping compound. You ever use sweeping compound? For you. Okay? We put 
I'd put a, like a, a ton of lime out there, and then you could come with your 500 pounds of uh, straight motor oil, and you wouldn't have a problem. Just go back a little bit. Are you saying that 6,000 pounds available? Available calcium. Yeah, I remember, it's a different story with the That's another class. <laughs> but, you know, you learn something that toxicity is directly related. Remember that molecule I showed you on the... On where the nitrogen is in the middle. That's a very important picture. Because if you have a lot of these molecules here, you've got a very watery, watery plant. You have no mineral, insect problems, and disease. But when you start adding the calcium to it, you all, then you start adding the minerals to it, and you get very healthy plants and animals. Okay. So calcium is a limiting factor in, in nature because it's a very unique element. It can only, in plants, it can only come from the ground. In people, it can only come from what you, from what you eat. Right. Good food, you wouldn't need any supplement. Mm -hmm. When a person has had uh, heavy uh, petrochemical exposure from a young age, Okay, there's two ways, there's two, okay, let's say you had a lot of petrochemical toxicity, okay? You're dealing in oils all the time. You've got a lot of them stuck in the body. Okay? Why are they stuck in the body? Do they want to be there? No. They want to leave, right? But there's a log jam. The log jam is salt and urea. You understand, none of these petrochemicals, none of these poisons have what you call a coherent frequency to the human body. The body does everything it can to get rid of them. But it can't. Because you've got a log jam here, you've got way too much salt, you've got way too much urea, and it has to wait its turn. So the body, instead of what it does, is it forces it back into the body tissue while it's cleaning out the ureas and the salt. In the meantime, <laughs> it becomes toxic in your body tissue. So what's the main thing you've got to do to start getting rid of these toxins that have you've accumulated in your body? When you get these salts down to 6C, you get these ureas down to working, your body will start dumping all the toxins in your body. Okay? You understand that? <laughs> yes, you really get sick as you dump them. I've actually, when I put people on this, one day they'd be walking around and said, everybody, you stink like gasoline. Who, me? Yeah, you. Because what happens, it's stored up into the tissue, and when the salts get down, the ureas get down, the body will dump it. It'll come out the pores, it'll come out the breath, it'll, you'll smell it in your urine. So if you want to, the reason they're in there is because they can't get out. Cigarettes. Cigarettes. I'll be driving, I had a girlfriend that used to smoke. We'd be driving around and says, are you smoking on me again? She says, no, honest. Because what happens as the salts drop, okay, in the ureas, the body releases that. One time we were driving down the car and I says, do you ever have an operation? And she looked at me and, and the, the ether that was in her body just, just broke loose all of a sudden. It's really a trip. But you understand, it can't do that until those salts get down and those ureas get down to the, where the body can release it. Pesticides the same way. See, our frequencies are very unique. And anything that is not harmoni harmonious to it, the body will do everything it can to get rid of it. But, you know, every time the train goes through the station, i.e. the kidney, when the water goes through the kidneys, the train's loaded, <laughs> okay? And the garbage's got to wait until the train has some capacity, i.e. until the water has some carrying ability.
when I, the food, okay, most of the pesticides in foods are external. So I soak them in peroxide. Peroxide is the only antidote there is to the uh, dioxins out there. But even if it gets in you, if my salts are down, my ureas are down, the minute it hits my digestive tract, the minute it hits the, uh, the blood, it hits the kidneys, it's down the sewer. Not a problem. So most of the pesticides, don't penetrate No. Most of them are on, on the... But people don't realize that, that there's two types of foods, okay? There's people food and there's bug food. When the mineral content, okay, when this apple up here is running at 18 or plus percent mineral, bricks, oil, gelatin, etc., that apple will rebuild the organs in the body, okay? And an insect can't eat it, can't eat it, because its digestive juices would ferment and it would literally explode on the tree, right? Now, as the sugar drops down to, say, 10 or low, what happens now is that apple does not have enough mineral to feed the organs in your body. So what happens is that tree begins to glow on the infrared zone. Insects are horny little devils. They've got what they call quarter wave infrared antennas on them. <laughs> you thought I was being crude, didn't you? Well, anyway, what happens is they can pick this up 20 miles away. And they'll come in there, and now, because the sugar level is so low that because when you eat it, it won't regenerate your body, it'll actually cause cancer. Nature has a built-in system that the bugs will come in there, and now they can eat it. Their digestive juices will actually take this substandard food and it will propagate the insect. So we come along and we blame the insecticides for eating food that should have been bug food to begin with. So insects are not, you know, the pesticides are really not the problem. Okay, the problem is now we eat an apple that's got maybe 10 bricks in it, which means that when we eat it, there's not enough mineral, sugar, gelatin, oil to sustain life. So the body begins to break down. But we sprayed it with a pesticide, so now we added a foreign substance to it, which goes into the body, but because it doesn't have the energy to get rid of it, it stores it back in there because of the ureas and the salts are too high, so it's got to stay in there. So we blame the pesticide. The pesticide ain't the problem. The problem was the apple sitting here at 10 bricks. You understand the system? That's what's happening. So we blame all the wrong things, that's why we can't fix them. If you don't know how the engine's broke, you can't fix it. <laughs> right. And, the, you know, because did that answer your question on how to get rid, start getting rid of that stuff? You get these salts down, you get these uh, ureas down, and then you'll start dumping that stuff as fast as you can. Okay, chemical sensitivity again because of the salts and the ureas are so high, the body just can't get rid of it. It just stays in there, and then it becomes part of the log jam. I tell you, this boy, I tell you, he had it down. I mean, he figured it out. And uh, basically, when we're doing Reams numbers, what we were all we're trying to do is force these numbers. We force these numbers here, the energy in, to where the body can build up enough energy to get rid of stuff. And then we keep the avenues, avenues of debris open so that we can get rid of the stuff. If we get rid of too much stuff, we're going to cause a problem. If we don't get rid of enough stuff, we're going <laughs> to build up the log jam, OK? I hope these numbers are starting to make a little sense to you. You know, did we cover how to test the salts? Yeah. Basically, the salts, I'll go through it again. 
This is a conductivity meter, okay? This is a conductivity meter. Remember what I told you, if you have a container with water, and if you put a voltage across it here, say I put 12 volts across it. In pure water, what happens? Your conductivity would be what? Zero. There's no flow of electricity. No, no electricity can flow on that liquid because there's no salt. You add a little salt in there, okay? You start getting a little flow, okay? You add more salt to it, you get more flow. The more salt you add to the fluid, the more flow you get. So when we're testing the salt level, okay, at 6C, we've got just the right salt level in our body so we get maximum flow of electricity based on cellular metabolism, okay? If we get too much salt in there, we get too much flow, okay? And the electrical system of the body don't work. Stick the conductivity meter in there, okay? Now remember, the conductivity meter reads in what? Moles of conductivity. One micro mole equals 700, or I'm sorry, <laughs> dyslexia is coming in. 1C equals 700 micro moles, okay? So whatever you get, ideally it should be, let's say, 600 or 6C times 700 equals what? 4,200 micro moles is what your urine should read. So basically, when you get a reading off your conductivity meter, you divide it by 700 to get your C number. And everything you do will affect these numbers, okay? And another thing Reem founds out, that if you don't rest, these numbers don't work. So basically, in his clinics, when he set up his retreats, I mean, you laid in bed. He allowed you to do two things, sleep or read the Bible. <laughs> and most people, after reading the Bible, would fall asleep anyway, so <laughs> he accomplished his end. And I find this. When I take the Sabbath off, I watch these numbers. These numbers, my pH will go to here. The salts will come in line, and the ureas will fall in line, okay? And if some people, if you don't rest, these numbers won't respond. So rest is real important. Okay, another thing he did, a lot of times when you put people on a diet, nothing happens, okay? You put them on the uh, calcium, you put them on everything. So what he did is he put them on a fast to shock the body into moving. Nothing but wa distilled water and lemon juice, okay, and rest for three days. That normally shocks the body enough to where it'll start moving in the proper direction. I mean, the numbers will go crazy when you do that, too. I mean, absolutely crazy. So if you're on, if, if you get people on the diet or, you know, doing what I said, and the numbers ain't changing, number two, they ain't drinking the water. <laughs> That's normally the biggest complaint, or they ain't taking the supplements. You can use reverse osmosis, but if you check the conductivity, it's a lot higher than... Okay, let me put it this way. Ideal water has got 50 micromoles of conductivity. Now, whether you get that through distillation or osmosis, I don't care. You don't want to use deionized water because when the water drops below 50 micromoles, you start drawing out good stuff from the body. Uh, basically, a distiller normally gets it to around 100, which is fairly good. Oh, so, so do you think you want to get 
a little above 50. 50 would be ideal, but you don't want to get it below 50. Uh, I've had water where I had a double distillate in a lot of places. I run it through my distiller, and then I run it through it again. Normally, a clinical distillation unit, which costs a lot of money, will get it down to below 50. Most standard units won't. Let, let's say you run the water through your uh, distiller, and it comes out to, say, 500 micromoles. I'd run it through again. <laughs> okay. I had some farming communities where the water is so bad, they have to double distill the water in order to get it down to about 50. The distiller, if you, if your water comes out 500, you've got terrific carryover. It's not because it's not taking it out, it's because it's being carried over. Another thing, in a distiller, what I normally do is you have a boiler, okay? You fill it with that much water, Okay, it goes off with steam into a pot, okay? You distill it down this far. The mistake most people make is then they fill this back up and do it again, okay? That's not right. After you distill this water, throw this water away because it's real concentrated, all right? And start all over again. See, most people just keep adding to this, okay? And this water keeps getting so damn toxic that it just boils over. Another thing is, the further you get above the boiling point, the more stuff you're going to get boiling over. In a clinical distillation unit, this runs at about 112 degrees, or 212. Uh, if you run it at a higher temperature, you get more stuff coming off, okay? But you really don't need a clinical <laughs> distillation unit. Brain, that's right, right. Brain density, you have to have it maintained within limits. If it's too low, you don't get good distillation. If it's too high, you get carried over. Because of the boiling temperature changes when the brine gets too high. But on, a, on an average boiler, all we do is I change the water every time I boil a, a gallon. I put a gallon and a half in the boiler, boil it down, boil a gallon of distilled water, throw it a half a gallon away, fill it back up and do it again. And that gets around 50 to 75 micromoles. So that's not telling you that water The conductivity water will tell you how pure it is, yeah. Yep. The more contamination you have in it, the higher the conductivity will read. Okay. Good meter. They don't sell this one anymore. If money was no object, <laughs> I would get that, D, that D4C. Otherwise, I would probably go to the next page and get that DST4. It only goes up to 19,000 or 20,000 micromoles, but if it pegs it, you know you're high anyway, right? But if you want to know what it is exactly, just dilute it back 50-50 and then double your answer. And you can still come up with the correct conductivity. Well, the reason is because they probably boil the water off at a real high temperature. And you're getting a lot of boil over in it. A lot of acids are boiling over. You can go to Sears and buy a distiller for about a hundred bucks. What you might do is before you boil the water is add a little baking soda to it, neutralize some of the acids and then boil it. I've had to do that. But a lot of the commercially done stuff is not very good water. Not good. And I hope they don't put stabilizers in it. <laughs> uh, 
No, not the, okay, remember what I told you, what's perfectly balanced water? I have one pound versus ten. Ten versus a hundred. But you see, when you're up here in this realm, the pH will vary quite a bit, but it really doesn't mean a whole lot, okay? The conductivity would probably be more of an accurate reading. Now remember, the less you have in the water, the more rapidly the pH will go up and down. Okay, but the more you have in the water, actually the more indicative the pH reading is of what's really in there. So even though the pH would read acid here, you don't have much in there. It'll still do the job. Okay? The main thing we do when we start on the Reams program is to get them salts down, get those ureas down, and then start supplementing with the minerals, all right? Well, you start them all at once, but the main thing that makes the system work is getting them salts down and getting those ureas in a manageable area. Then your body can start utilizing the mineral that you put in it. But if somebody's sugar is running up there, or I mean, if their salts are running up there at 30, you know, they ain't utilizing anything. If somebody's sugars are running up there between 8 and 9, they ain't utilizing anything. It's just a downhill skid. So if you look at the numbers, and the rule is the further they are from perfect, the worse the problem. Okay, as a rule, if you look at these numbers, if you look at these numbers in the B category, you, you know, it's not really that much of a problem. You get up into a C, you're dealing with some problems. You get into D, you got some real severe problems. You get in down into E, you might as well tell them to get their affairs in order. <laughs> okay. You know what RT is now? Okay. And you want to work on the worst part, okay? Like if somebody, most people's pHs are down here in the acid zone. So you know you're already sitting down there in 25 to 50% reserve energy. Okay, so you need to seriously start bringing that pH up. And then most people's salts are up here in the 35 plus zone. More dental problems? A lot, what they'll tell you is that the acid is eating the caries away, but the real problem is if you're sitting down here in the acid zone, you've got no calcium going back in them teeth. Like I said yesterday, there was this test done back in the 30s. Right, I just want to comment to that. A dental hygienist has worked on lots and lots of teeth, told me that uh, her job is to take the teeth and get them to Basically, the test they did back in the 30s, 1930s, where they checked people were in their 90s plus with no dental caries, uh, still working and chasing women. Okay, when they checked these people, the calcium phosphorus level in their saliva was five to six times the phosphorus calcium level in people's saliva today. Now, the teeth are a very interesting organ. The teeth will actually extract calcium and phosphorus from the saliva. You can take a tooth and yank it out of somebody's mouth, and what's it got on it? It's got hair on it, no hairs. The thing about a tooth is, is that it can actually feed from the calcium and from the uh, phosphorus in your mouth. You can yank a tooth out of somebody's mouth, stuff it back in there, and it'll grow again. Okay? You can have a dentist come in there, and he can kill the nerve to your tooth, and it'll last you 30, 40 years. Why? Because that tooth is still feeding.
So what I'm starting to do, <laughs> this calcium hydroxide, I put it in my mouth every day, and I just hold it there for as long as I can. Okay, little trick. Now what I'm trying to do is get a calcium phosphorus solution that I can do the same thing on. But, you know, if I wanted to help my teeth along, you know, this calcium, this lime water I talked about earlier, well, just take an ounce of that and hold it in your mouth, okay? For as long as you can. And your teeth will suck that calcium right out of that calcium hydroxide. Are you talking about this, uh, lime water. The no. I'm talking about the lime water. The lime water. Lime water. The calcium hydroxide. Remember we put that in a gallon of water to make lime water, to make calcium water? Right. That's what I'm talking about. Another interesting thing is the calcium, or the mincol will do the same thing. You can put that, break a capsule of mint call, put it in your mouth, and you're, it'll feed the teeth direct. It does not have to go through the digestive system. Even if the mint call is the same no, the mint call or the lime water. Okay. Yeah, it does. I'm trying to develop a liquid now that will duplicate what we had back in the 30s so that we could just... Wouldn't it be nice having a lollipop, you know, you could suck on that would draw your teeth back? <laughs> I think it can be done. I really do. That's what I'm working on now. I think they'll grow back. See, when basically, about 15 years ago, I started the Reams program, and everybody would bring their kids in. And at that time, Eli Lilly had a calcium glutinate on the market that had a mint in it or something. And I put these kids on this calcium glutinate with this mint in it, and their cavities would actually grow back out. You know, and they'd go to the dentist, and the dentist said, Johnny, God, you're doing a good job brushing your teeth. Johnny would look at him and say, I don't brush my teeth. And then they'd, they'd question him, you know, what's going on here? So we're taking this calcium glutinate by Lily, you know. I had about 40 families on that in my area. Guess what? Took it off the market. So Eli Lilly and me are on bad terms. Well, the same thing with the pathologist player, my daughter, you know, working on it. Eli Lilly got the passports up to his factory. Okay, another story about how the system operates. Gulf War syndrome has probably killed six or seven thousand of our prime fighting men in this country. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a doctor down south that isolated, isolated what Gulf War syndrome was. It was mycoplasma toxicity. Well, when an animal gets mycoplasma toxicity, we would just pop them a TBZ wormer. Two days later, that animal was up kicking around, no problem. Okay. So as soon as I found out that uh, Gulf War syndrome was mycoplasma toxicity, we, w we started giving TBZ wormer to these Gulf vets. All, their all symptoms disappeared overnight. TBZ wormer. I mean, all the Gulf War syndromes disappeared overnight. Within two weeks of that revelation, TBZ wormer was taken off the market. Within another week, all TBZ wormer was out of the pipeline. Now, you don't think we have some evil people in charge of our government. Those men were killed on purpose by our own government. And these are two personal experiences that I've had of discovery and failure <laughs> about what our government does as soon as something works. I can give you a dozen more stories on other substances that I've used. Hmm? Jet and violet is another one. So you understand, you know, uh, basically, the French soldiers who went over to Gulf War massacre basically were given doxycycline, which is the establishment's 
cure for mycoplasma toxicity. Not a one of their soldiers came down with Gulf War syndrome. Basically, the Gulf War veterans that we have that recommend doc or you know ask for doxycycline, they won't give it to them. So the doctors are murdering all our type fighting men. I mean, that's what's going on, okay? That's what's going on in my country. An interesting thing, I have a friend who is a, he's a nerd. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's on the internet. So I asked him, why don't you go and check TBZ Wormer for me, see what they got in the internet. So he put in TBZ, went in and says, hey, there's a whole lot, I, wait a minute, my computer just crashed. So not only did they take it off the market, they're protecting the, right, crashed his computer looking for TBZ information. Doxycycline is the medication. Doxycycline. Which, you know, that's what's going on. And this is what we're up against. So every time we find something that works, you know, we just, they take it off the market. But that was, that's out and out murder. It's done by our own government to our own top fighting men. So why can't we make self-improvement ourselves? Well, I used to, but somehow Eli Lilly had a formula that made it work really good. It was mint. And it was like either a half gram or one gram kid, uh, tablet. Tasted really good. Kids would line up for their calcium, okay? They wanted it. <laughs> and man, their teeth went out, and I watched the kids. Calcium deficiency starts in the jaw. The jaw becomes narrow, okay? The teeth become crowded. When they were on this stuff, their jaws were starting to spread, okay? They were getting back to, to their genetic potential. And, the, and their, their cavities were actually growing back out. And an Eli Lilly cut it off. Fluoride? Fluoride basically will numb your brain. <laughs> and if you mix chloride or fluorine and chlorine, it only takes a quarter of a much to do it. Sure. But it numbs your brain. Well, I know guys that work for Eli Lilly and they can't get it. I talked to guys in Europe to see if they had it in the European theater and they can't find it. So if anybody can get the formula, I would sure appreciate it. The Eli Lilly, their calcium glutamate. And why that calcium glutamate works so good is because of the mint that was with it, and I think they added a little more sugar to it to make it work even better. So I would sure like to find out what made it work. Because I've tried to duplicate it, and I can't. Yeah. Any more questions? Another interesting thing, every 20 years of life, <laughs> Your ability goes down, well, let's just say a man of 40 heals twice as slow as a man of 20. A man at 40 or 60 heals twice as slow as a man at 40. So the base exchange rate goes down by half every 20 years. So what happens is that the older you get, the slower things <laughs> happen, okay? This is just what he found is to be the base exchange slows down every 20 years. It, it goes in half. Now, I don't know if this is genetic or what, but this is just the way it is. That's why I like working with kids because, man, things happen real fast. Us older guys, we take a little longer.
So the older the people are, when you do this, things are just going to happen slower because the basic change rate, I don't know if that's an internal clock or what, but that's just the way it is. Happens slower. Okay, any other questions you might have on the subject? You know, it's basically an ongoing deal. It's something you have to monitor. If the numbers aren't moving towards perfect, you ain't doing something right. And what's going to happen is that every time these numbers go past one of these lines, okay, there's going to be a healing crisis, okay? You might, might as well count on it because the body changes gears. That's why those lines were drawn there is because he noticed when those numbers went through those lines that the body would shift into, it would shift into another energy pattern, as you would call it. And, you know, working in herbs, monarchy, and this, I mean, we're still in the first grade, you know. I've been studying this 30 years, and I'm still in the first grade. <laughs> any, any questions about anything? <laughs> I hope I gave you enough to think about today. But I'll tell you, this, this is a very, a very uh, involved process, okay? And as you can see, you're dealing with a differential equation there that's got a billions of different combinations, okay? <laughs> that is a differential equation. And you're dealing with a lot of variables. But remember one thing, if one of these numbers is off, they're all off, okay? And someday we'll be living back in this range again, okay? There's a biological clock that Reams noticed that this happened regardless if you were in a if you were an A or an E didn't make any difference. So I know what you're talking about, but that's just the way the chemical reactions slow down in the body as we get older. Uh, why that is, I don't know. This has got nothing to do with aging factor. This has to do with basic change. Chemical reactions slow down in the body with age. It's got nothing to do with aging, all right? Aging is something else. This is this has not had this got nothing to do with aging factor. This has to do with basic change. See, 20 years is our generation. And every animal, it's interesting, is directly, every animal has a very unique gestation period and period of time between infancy and adulthood. Ours is 20 years. So a lot of our chemical reactions are based on that internal pattern. It's got nothing to do with showing age. <laughs> okay. It's interesting. Women who are, you know, you get in here, basically your periods, okay, and a woman who's in these areas, 
in the periods, there's no blood. There's basically what you see is spinal fluid, no blood. And it's only like a day or two. So, you know, you're in a whole different ball game when you're in this area. One thing I like about this system, it's not based on my opinion, it's not based on anybody's opinion, it's based on numbers, okay? If you know anything about engines, you know that when certain things, an engine is designed to function under certain parameters, okay? This is an engine, okay, inside. And our engine was designed to function under these parameters right here. And when we tweak it just right, the engine purrs, okay? And the further we get from these numbers, the further this engine is off kilter, okay? It's like if an engine is designed to run at six degrees advanced, it runs at six degrees advanced. If you go above that or below it, it don't run very good, okay? That's what I'm talking about here. These numbers are designed to make this mobile meat box operate at peak performance, okay? So you're now, we're now all body mechanics, okay? <laughs> Open up a body shop. <laughs> and we'll tweak the carburetor, okay? And that's what I'm talking about. Well, these courses, when you took them originally, they were six courses a week long at, at $5,000 a week. So you're getting by cheap. <laughs> Nobody teaches this. Basically, this, you know, the reason I'm teaching this because what I see out here is this, this information is being lost, okay? And we got to get it back out again. And that's what your job is, is to, to keep it pure. I tried to keep it according to his teachings, okay? I'm trying to keep my own crap out of it. Okay, this is the pure teaching. It's not my opinion. This is what he taught. I know it works, and this is what I teach. Try to keep it, you know, I'll throw in my own comments once in a while, but I, I'm keeping the science as pure as I can. Well, Dr. Reem. He's what? Well, he was murdered. He was murdered. See, the man had his kidneys blowed out, or he had shrapnel in him in the war. Once in a while, they'd act up. Well, he was down in Florida. They went to the hospital, and as soon as they found out who he was on the computer, they cut both his kidneys free, sewed him back up, and he died four days later. That was a fourth attempt at his life. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. The first time they killed him, you see, his numbers, because he did this at a very age, ran in the, you know, in the A range, okay? They gave him a double dose of laudamin, which is what the uh, gangsters used to kill other gangsters with. And his gastric juices were so strong that they neutralized the poison, okay? He was in the hospital, you know, sicker than a dog. He ran his own numbers, says, I got poisoning. So they pumped his stomach, and they found a laudamin, and it was neutralized by stomach acid. That's how powerful the man was. And this happened to him twice. Last time they got him, he was in the hospital, cut his kidney tree, sewed him back up there, and then sat back and watched him die. Okay? 
Nobody was ever charged. The nurses that were in that hospital were so mad that they couldn't say anything because they'd be on a hit list if they did, if they said anything. Okay. Oh, I mean that's just his story. He was over 84 years old and he still had just had a son. Okay. So this works on more than one level. <laughs> And okay, this is basically, huh? But like I said, the, the numbers don't lie. And when you watch these numbers and you're doing it right, uh, the body will function at, at peak performance. So just think of this as a tune-up class, <laughs> okay? And you only need like five gauges, basically, as equipment to tune the engine up. That's it? That's it. <laughs>